Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners regular meeting for November the 18th, 2013. As a reminder for everyone in the audience, this is a live broadcast, so we would appreciate it if, if you have a mobile device that you will put it on silent or vibrate so that it doesn't go off um, during the broadcast. Again, it's live tonight. This meeting will also be shown um, Saturday and Sunday at 1 p.m., um, Sunday and Tuesday at 6.30 p.m., and Thursday and Friday at 6.30. We alternate with the Board of Education, Cabarrus County Board of Education's uh, meetings are also shown. So I know a lot of people like to watch this show. I'm always amazed at how many people see this on TV and comment about it. So um, thank you all for being here tonight. We have a huge standing room only crowd. Uh, the first thing that we do is the presentation of colors. We have a large contingency from St. James Lutheran Church, Boy Scout Troop 91 with us tonight. Please rise for the presentation of colors. Guard, post the colors. <coughs> Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Look our retreat. We're also pleased to welcome Dr. John Todd III, the interim senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Concord, to provide our invocation. Welcome. Madam Chair, Commissioners, fellow citizens, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we pause in gratitude to you for the graciousness you've bestowed upon us, for the providence that is around us, for the eternal goodness that is within us. In so many ways, O oh God, you've blessed our lives and our world with bountiful gifts and immeasurable opportunities. For all that we've received, for all that we could hope for, especially during this season of Thanksgiving, we are indeed most grateful. We remember tonight those around our world and those who are near to us in this place who may be suffering from natural disasters or malfortunes or calamities of their lives. As you have blessed us, O oh God, enable us to be a blessing to those in need. We especially ask for your guidance tonight upon the members of this commission who have been chosen to govern the business and work of Cabarrus County, grant to these elected leaders, we pray, the wisdom and the insight they need to choose what is right and just, to speak with integrity and insight, and to act with wisdom and compassion in all of their undertakings. And give to each of us, we pray, as citizens in our various communities and individual stations in life, the determination and the courage always to work for justice, to strive for peace, and to apply the teachings of your word. For we offer this prayer in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Todd. Um, we do appreciate all the scouts being here. What I'd <coughs> like for you to do is to come up to the microphone um, notice the microphones will move up and down very easily. Um, I always have to pull that one down when I get there because I'm a little bit shorter than a lot of you guys are, but adjust the microphone. Um, what I'd like for you to do is tell us your name and what school you go to and tell me why you like scouting so much. And then I'd like for you to go to your left, my right, and Commissioner Burridge will give you a county pin. So welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Sawyer Brown. I'm a Life Scout and I joined in 2010. I, I go to Northwest Cabarrus Middle School. And what do you like about scouting? I like camping out. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm Ethan Briggs. Um, I'm a first class scout. I've joined last year, just after Thanksgiving. Uh, I go to Concord Middle, and I I like being able to learn things that are needed in life. Thank you. I'm Hunter Elliott. I go to Winkler Middle School. What, what do you like about scouting? It's fun. It's fun. In what way? Always. <laughs> I don't blame you there. Um, my name is Tyler Doran. Um, I'm a first uh, a star scout, and I. I go to Mount Pleasant High, and I like camping. Thank you. My name's Calvin Bowerman, and I go to A.T. Allen School, and I'm new to Scouts. And what, have you been in Scouting long? When did you start? Um, have you gone camping yet? Apparently that's the question to ask. Not yet. <laughs> they better get to work on getting you camping, shouldn't they? Anything else that you like? What made you start Scouting? I don't know. Friends or parents? Parents. Parents. That's a good answer. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Cameron. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout. I go to Concord High School, and I like scouting because I get to hang out with these guys. Good answer. Thank you. My name is Adam Conversano. I go to Concord Middle School, and I joined scouting for learning and life's lessons. Thank you. I'm Jay Cruz. I go to Central Cabarrus High School. Um, I don't remember when I joined scouting, and I'm an Eagle Scout. You look like you've been very busy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What do you like best about scouting? Um, the thrill. <laughs> Good answer. Thank you. Um, I'm Christopher Thomas. Um, I go to Concord Middle. And the thing I like about scouting is the camping. Thank you. My name is Joshua Flanagan, and I go to Mount Pleasant Middle School. And my favorite thing about scouting is camping. Thank you. <laughs> so I think the lesson that they're... Um, counselors need to think about is uh, camping often and um, apparently none of them had run into too many snakes or that we might have had a different answer so but thank you all very much for coming out we appreciate the adults that are working hard with these <coughs> nice fine young men um, and teaching them a lot of life lessons so thank you all very much for being here um, commissioners the first item that we have is approval or correction of the minutes I do want to point out let me find it. Item number G2, which is the department ordinance related to the new general statute. Um, I'd like to move that to December. Ms. Strong is not available, and um, tonight she's out of town, and I think we would do better if she's here with us for us to get some questions answered. So if that's okay with you, I'd like to move that one to December. Um, otherwise, um, I would accept a motion I'm sorry, I jumped right past the minutes, didn't I? Um, let me back up. Let me get, we have the minutes. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So I have a motion to have a second. Second. Motion to second. All in favor of the, approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, sorry about that. Now the approval of the agenda, which would be to table item G2 and move it to the December meeting. Um, all those in favor of approving the agenda with the change? Is, or I'm sorry, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'm getting ahead of myself tonight. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Okay, let's go on to recognitions and presentations. Uh, the first thing we have tonight is Historic Cabarrus Association presentation. Um, Joanne Gonnerman is here. Here we go. Commissioner Meesmer, you're a, you're a member of that group. Um, anything you want to say before she starts? or? I just um, want to say uh, thanks to Joanne Garnerman. She has been our executive director for over a year now, and she has done a fantastic job um, with the organization and moving our organization forward. And the Historic Cabarrus Association, which I know Joanne will uh, discuss, is a very good um, group, a member 
a group and a membership of individuals that care much about the history of Cabarrus County and um, what took place before us and really want to preserve that and make certain that anyone in the future uh, will have access to information um, about the history of Cabarrus County. So, thank you, Joanne, for being here. And I, I just want to ab lib for a minute and, and say my, my presentation is just a little different because I have a very special guest with us this evening. Um, so you, you'll, you'll understand in one moment. Chairman Poole, Vice Chair Miesmer, Commissioners, Mr. Downs, Mr. Cook, Ms. Smith, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this evening. My name is Joanne Gonerman, and I am here on behalf of Historic Cabarrus Association with a letter of appreciation I would like to share with you. Dear Commissioners and County Administrators, thank you for allowing Historic Cabarrus Association the opportunity to present its two local museums in Cabarrus County properties. As you know, Historic Cabarrus Association sponsors the Concord Museum in the historic 1876 Courthouse and the Cabarrus County Veterans Museum in the rotunda of the Cabarrus County Governmental Center. Each of these county-owned properties provides an ideal environment for our exhibits and greatly enhances the museum experience for our patrons. We are most grateful for this partnership and your generous support of our organization. As a courtesy and to update you on our activities, I have provided you a copy of the September 29th issue of the Independent Tribune newspaper, which features a front page news story about Historic Cabarrus Association and the historical documents we have uncovered in our archives. I have also included a program from our 2013 annual membership meeting, highlighting key events of our organization during the past year. These are in a white envelope at your seat. I hope you enjoy reading these publications and learning more about our accomplishments. In addition to these updates, I want to invite you to visit the Concord Museum and the Cabarrus County Veterans Museum. Please visit soon and often. The current exhibit at the Concord Museum commemorates the 40th anniversary of the saving of the historic 1876 Cabarrus County Courthouse. That exhibit ends December 19th. And at the Cabarrus County Veterans Museum, we are featuring military uniforms secured for us by members of the Fred Y. McConnell American Legion Post 51, with whom we have formed a partnership to obtain military uniforms worn by Cabarrus County servicemen and servicewomen. Currently, a World War I uniform is the oldest military uniform on display. In closing, as Executive Director of Historic Cabarrus Association, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, our staff, and our museum patrons, I want to say thank you. Now I would like to ask the volunteers, excuse me, now I would like to ask the veterans and members of the Fred Y. McConnell American Legion Post 51, who assist Cabarrus, Historic Cabarrus with the change of military uniforms in our Veterans Museum, to introduce themselves. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, members, uh, Ms. Madam Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Ron Farley. I'm the commander of Concord Post uh, 51, which is one of the oldest uh, American Legion posts in the United States, founded November 20, 1919. We were approached by Joanne to assist in uh, the uh, placement of the uniforms and finding uh, more or less complete uniforms of veterans of Cabarrus County. Uh, that have served uh, honorably in the military and, of course, other military artifacts that we do have uh, some uh, at, the, at the post. At this time, I'd like to uh, thank you for your support in that project, and I'd like to introduce two native uh, <clears throat> veterans that are members of our post. Uh, <clears throat> Tom, would you come up, and, and Don? Tom Russell. And Don Fager, Tom Russell is also Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, League in Concord. And, there, and <coughs> Don Fager, two lifelong members of Cabarrus County, so I'd like to let them speak on their own behalf. I'm Tommy Russell, United States Marine Corps Vietnam veteran, and I'm a Commandant of the Marine Corps League. I'd like to thank the Cabarrus County Board for allowing, and Joanne for allowing us to take part in the uniform changing downstairs. I think it's a very important part of Cabarrus County. Thank you. <coughs> 
I am Don Faggart. I'm a lifelong resident of Cabarrus County and a resident of Concord City for the last 50 years. But anyway, I would like to thank the uh, commissioners for allowing us to put our uniforms out here in the rotunda because it means a lot to us. And it means a lot to our families that are veterans to come here and see, especially my uniform on a mannequin downstairs so that they'll know what I looked like when I was in the Army. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't wear it anymore, but my, my son probably, my grandson can. But um, anyway, I spent six years in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and um, I had quite a, a experience in the, in the Army. I started out at Fort Jackson, got through with there. They shipped me all the way across the United States to Fort Ord, California, which was a great duty. I always called it vacation because it was right on the beach. And then they sent me back to Fort Meade, Maryland, and then I ended up at Fort Bragg, so that was close to home. But I had a good time. Um, we trained. Um, I feel, sort of felt sorry for the, the troops we were training to build pontoon bridges across the canals and uh, later on found out it was Viet um, yeah, Vietnam is where they were going. And I often wondered how many of those guys that I trained to build pontoon bridges for the tanks and the trucks and the troops to walk across never made it back. But anyway, I want to thank Joanne too for all her kindness and information and especially you folks. Thank you. This is a good opportunity for everybody here. When you get ready to leave tonight, right underneath you, downstairs on the first floor, you'll see the display cases. <coughs> so before you exit tonight, take a moment and look around and you can see the uniforms that are on display. Thank you all very much for, for being here and for, for participating um, and providing the uh, uniforms that are down there. Uh, the next item we have, Tony Harris is here. I don't know if you want to do an introduction first or if Andy's going to come on up for a recognition. Welcome. Yeah. Commissioner Poole, Vice Chair Miesmer, to all other fellow commissioners, to County Manager Mike Downs, to County Attorney Rich Cook and Megan Smith, have the distinguished, distinguished honor of um, recognizing John Yost Sr., better known as Andy, to most people in the county. Uh, he joined the county in 2012 as the safety and risk coordinator. He's definitely uh, made a tremendous impact within the county, overseeing the uh, workers' compensation. He's been definitely a valuable uh, addition to the risk management team. Uh, one of his goals when he joined the county was to earn his MESH uh, certificate, uh, which is a program uh, sponsored through North Carolina State University the Safety and Health Council of North Carolina and the North Carolina Department of Labor. It requires for him to go through, complete 100 hours of continuing education uh, to obtain the certificate. The certificate is signed by Charles McDonald. He's the president of the Safety and Health Council of North Carolina. Uh, Teresa Ratcliffe. Uh, she is the uh, Vice Provost for Outreach and Extension for North Carolina State uh, University and uh, Commissioner Berry from the Commissioner of, uh, for the Department of Labor. And so I would like to present this to Andy Yost for the great job that he's done. Thank you. All right. I'd just like to take one second and say thank you to Tony Harris and all my colleagues in the county manager's office and for my family for all your continued support. Thank you. Wait a minute. Before you go away, I want, they, they've been dying to get a good picture of you actually facing them. So, Tony, if you'll stand up there next to, to Andy and hold up your picture because so, that's always good to have a proud family here. Got it? Good. Thank you very much and congratulations. Um, next, we have uh, some folks that work with Cabarrus County Schools. I know I saw Lynn Reimer here earlier. Lynn, if you'll come up. And Emily Riley. There we go. <laughs> if y'all will come up. Um, we tried it. You guys are hard to get a hold of. I'm just kidding. It's okay. Um, 
Emily has been is the Cabarrus County Special Olympics Coordinator, and she was named Special Olympics of North Carolina's Coordinator of the Year. And Lynn Reimer is the principal at Central Cabarrus High School, and there may be one or two people here in the audience that know you. So, see, that was great that you're here tonight so that, you know, they can all be here to support you. Um, and Lynn was named Principal of the Year for Cabarrus County Schools, and um, I don't know where you are in your competition with the – I know you won the regions. Did you win the state? Or have they decided that yet? Or you can't tell us? Yes, I won the North Carolina High School Principal of the Year. It's even better. So we have, see, that was something I didn't know all the way. So um, we want to give you a chance because you both, um, as a principal, you're very busy and obviously very committed to your school. And Special Olympics is very dear to all of our hearts. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about Special Olympics? And you can tell us a little bit about Principal of the Year. I know you got recognized earlier. I did. So, and sorry, I missed the last meeting. I was recognized um, back in August for Special Olympics Coordinator of the Year for um, North Carolina. And um, I was among 100 coordinators, so to me that is a huge honor. I want to thank you all for allowing me to be here tonight to share my honor with you all. Though I really appreciate the award I received from Special Olympics North Carolina, the biggest honor that I have is actually being the coordinator and getting to work with the individuals that I serve. Cabarrus County has an amazing group of athletes, and I am proud to be their coordinator. Our okay. program keeps growing, and at the time we serve over 700 individuals with intellectual or other related developmental disabilities in Cabarrus County. At this time, we are offering training and competition opportunities in 16 of the 19 Special Olympics North Carolina sports, which keeps me very busy. Athletes are given the opportunity to train during the evenings or on the weekends with some great coaches in a variety of Olympic-type sports. We just finished up our fall sports um, and have begun our basketball cheerleading alpine skiing teams. Some other exciting news that we have going on is um, back in October, um, one of our athletes, Eric Gluff, and his dad, um, Kerry Gluff, who was his unified partner, got to go to the National Golf Invitational in New Jersey, and they got fourth place in their division. Uh, Ron and Lynn Stipe, who is a very active family in our county, um, they have three boys with autism, and they um, all participate in Special Olympics. They were just named Family of the Year for um, for the state, and that is a huge honor for them and very deserving because they are very active in our community. And then Darius Robinson was chosen to attend the 2014 USA Games in New Jersey, and he will be going the, um in, to New Jersey in June in cycling. So we have a lot of stuff going on in Cabarrus County, and we are very proud of the athletes that we serve. And as always, we are once again hosting our spring games at the Cabarrus Arena for individuals to attend with their schools or agencies. Um, the track and field event will be on April 8th and 9th this year. It's a little bit earlier than normal. I encourage you to come out and cheer on the athletes because they absolutely love having people out there to cheer them on. I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to bring my award tonight and for recognizing me and also for the support that the county commissioners as well as the county government gives to our, um, to not just to me in my position, but also to our um, program. Um, our program is one of the best because of people like you all. So thank you. If somebody, sorry. <laughs> Hang on one second. If somebody is interested in volunteering um, and getting involved, how can they get in touch with you? Um, you can actually go to our website, which is www.sonc.net, or look up Special Olympics um, North Carolina. And if you look on the Cabarrus County website uh, webpage, then you will see my information. And just contact me, and I would love to have volunteers because we use, at Spring Games, we use eight, at least 800 volunteers. So we are always in need of volunteers during Spring Games and throughout the year. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Ms. Reimer, can you tell us, I know, so when you were uh, picked locally and then you won the district and now you've won the state, what are some of the things that, that, are gonna fa that you're going to be responsible for? What do you have to do? Um, and I guess you go on to nationals. Yes, that's already happened. Um, okay. Once you, re once you win the region, you go to the uh, state competition and they nominate a middle school and a high school principal to represent the state of North Carolina uh, in Washington, D.C. I did that in September. I uh, went to Capitol Hill where I spent four days and uh, spent time with Senator Burr and 
um, our representatives there, uh, trying to talk about public education and the needs of our students and uh, where we are now. So I got to advocate there. Uh, I travel often to Raleigh to work with the uh, state legislators on current public issues, many that we have now. Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm extremely blessed to have had the opportunity to be in Cabarrus County. I've worked at uh, three different high schools here, Concord, Northwest, and Central. So I've had incredible staffs, and uh, the, the students and the kids here are fantastic. With support like yours and our school board and the staffs, it makes, makes my job real easy. So I've been very fortunate. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And we also want to recognize from Kannapolis City Schools their Teacher of the Year, Rebecca Merriman. Hey, welcome. Tell Hello. us what school year you, you teach at and or how far are you in the process of because um, I know you have to compete. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Merriman, and I'm a proud teacher at Jackson Park Elementary School. I teach kindergarten. Um, I was very blessed to be nominated for my school and be selected as their teacher of the year, then to go on to compete at the district level. Um, I won for my district, but unfortunately, I did not win for the regionals. But I know that my place is solidified in the classroom, so I'll have a lot more um, to do with my students. So I'm just very blessed, and I'm so excited to have had this wonderful opportunity. Well, it's our pleasure to be able to recognize you and to, um, to make sure that everybody, other than Kannapolis City Schools, uh, understands that um, you do a great job in the classroom. So thank you all very, very much for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Hey, next we have the Cabarrus County Extension and Community Association presentation of the Centennial Holiday Tree. Joyce Klutz is here and some other members. I know you have a number of members in the audience, like always. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, whenever we had the proclamation not too long ago uh, to commemorate our 100 years, we decided on that planning time that we needed to set some goals for the year. So we did. And they all uh, revolved around 100. And one of the first things we did was and these are our community issues that we try to address. Uh, we did 100 pints of blood. We wanted to do that the entire year to come up with 100 pints of blood that is either giving or helping at our sites. Right now we're at 90, so we're almost there. 100 cans of food, and this is to Salvation Army and CCM, and this is just continually. 100 cards to friends, neighbors, a hundred bears made for Victory Junction. You hold up this bear. This is just the hardest thing in the world to make. Barbara Looney, Barbara Looney is our maker and we're the stuffers. But um, we did make a hundred bears for Victory Junction. A hundred items donated to the Boys and Girls Home in Lake Waccamaw. These are two of our very important state projects. 100 items, items for the Veterans Hospital in Salisbury, and 100 handmade ornaments for our 1913 Christmas tree downstairs in the Rotunda. Rotunda. And of course, we really exceeded all these goals by more than we can count, quite frankly. Uh, one of the big things we did for our celebration was purchase bricks to go into the garden area at McKimmon Center on the University of uh, North Carolina, North Carolina State University. And we did this in honor and in memory of individuals. And the funds realized for this event goes into our ECA Foundation. And the, in turn, that foundation money comes back to the counties for grants that they may write for particular projects that they may have. Uh, a fun thing that we did, every county was given a piggy bank. And a piggy bank was this big, and we could decorate it any way we wanted to. Well, ours was decorated and uh, signed by a race car driver named Danica Patrick. And, of course, Randolph County, they had um, Richard Petty sign that pig. 
So these can be seen on eBay and you can buy it. So please look and see if those pigs are on eBay and purchase one. That money again goes into the foundation. Uh, for our pig, we did contribute $500. We collected that over an extended period of time. And um, we do want to thank you for uh, recognizing us for 100 years and Cabarrus County Cooperative Extension. We appreciate that so very much. And one of the last things um, for our gala celebration, we are all given a ball jar, a blue ball jar. They're 100 years old today. I mean, this year too with us. So our jar was empty, but we brought a ball jar for you and it's filled with chocolate candy. So our members are here to give each of you a 100 year old ball jar. So, okay, ladies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I love you. Yes, it is. Hey, if we can get all of your group to stand up at one time so that um, we can make sure we get you on the cameras and we do. Y'all y'all always do such a great job with everything that you do, and um, I'll make sure I hide this before I get home. Because <laughs> I have a feeling somebody at home is probably watching this. You guys better hide yours, too. I'm just saying. You know, all's fair in love and chocolate. So, But you guys are great. Thank you so much for always doing everything that you do and being here. Okay, commissioners, the next item we have is informal public comments. I have a number of cards tonight. Um, uh, uh, again, please, if you'll adjust your microphone if you need to when you come up. Um, uh, first up is Price Crutchfield. Welcome. Hey. Um Somebody accused me the other day of smoking dope. I've never done that in my life. It's against my religion. Speaking about religion, I'm concerned about something. I've been trying to get the government over here at the courthouse to answer some questions pertaining to the Holy Bible. And I was wanting to know if my tax money is helping to pay for the Holy Bible over at the courthouse. Now, I'm concerned that not all of us are held to the standards of, of telling the truth when we put our hand on that Bible because a Concord police officer who's now retired, his name is Scott Newell, he lied under oath on me in court to Judge Hammy after he put his hand on that Bible. And again, I want to know if my tax money is helping to pay for that Bible. If it is, then my money is being stewarded in the wrong way. He broke the law and lied under oath, and he told Judge Hamby, he said, Your Honor, he's come into restaurants and harassed my family. I've never harassed anybody's family in my life. But if you're with the police in Concord, you can lie under oath and nothing's going to happen to you. Maybe I'm not, I know what it is, I'm not a member of the right church. Now, if I hook up with the right church, and the right people over at the courthouse find out about it, well, shoot, I'll be in by, just like Flint. Then I might be able to get a job on the police force, maybe. And then I could lie under oath, and nothing would happen to me. But uh, all jokes aside, this is pretty serious stuff, and the police are getting out of hand. I think we've all seen this, or most of us have seen this video, of this police shooting at this woman and all her kids in the car this morning on TV. I mean, on a more serious note, these police are getting out of hand. When they're not, it seems when they're not busy involved in... Uh, you know, child internet pornography and stuff like that, stuff that I've talked about in the past, nobody listened to. Then they're busy shooting at people's kids in cars. Now, I've always wondered about that deal over there in Charlotte where that man, he worked on that cell tower, and the police killed him. And he's putting them two girls through college. I never was satisfied about the ending of that deal. 
And then recently that other man over there that was uh, shot by the police and now they're, they're going to get away with that. The police are out of hand. They're out of hand in this country. Something's got to be done about it. And quite frankly, I think the religious right and this homeland security thing and all this stuff has got it out for people like me that really know what's going on. This is the old uh, let's just subjugate them and uh, keep them down and uh, business as usual. There's some dangerous things going on out there. And it's going on by organized groups with guns on their side. Those are the worst kind of criminals. It's just organized groups with guns that are getting away with stuff. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Thank you. Next we have John Stanley. Commissioners, you have a handout at your seats also. Please. Welcome. Obviously, I'm John Stanley, and uh, I was in the Army 1967 to 1969. Um, and I've peaked on camping uh, back in 67 down in Fort Gordon, Georgia. So for what you mentioned, um, North Carolina has the third largest pro uh, capita population of veterans in the country. And someone forgot to tell them this. Um, in 2008, Congress passed a law uh, that there will be a commemoration of Vietnam veterans in the year, starting the year 2015. Uh, in 2012, it was announced at the uh, wall. But again, somebody forgot to tell North Carolina. Um, I also have copies of the commemorative partners list, and there are about 20 pages there, of which there are about four or five organizations from North Carolina. I'm very proud to say that Concord is the first municipality to be on that commemorative partners list. I think there's only two copies out there, so it'll have to be passed around. And what we're trying to do here is we've decided to get together and create the Cabarrus Veterans Coalition. Uh, we were originally going to call it the Cabarrus uh, Vietnam Veterans Coalition, but this is going to be an inclusive organization. We're working with Burr's office. We're working with Hagen's office. Uh, we're working with uh, the other county councils in Rowan and Ira Dell. So this is going to be a national event that's going to be home-centric. And every municipality, every organization, the Boy Scouts here, the Historic Club, all of these people can be a part of it. And what we're trying to do, rather than uh, do what I call, have been talking about as herding cats, is working through one central group so that we can plan, plan this uh, very well. I would ask anybody who's inter interested in this uh, to uh, go to the website and you'll really see what a national website is like. Uh, it's www.vietnamwar50, that's 5OTH.com. And you'll get, this is just an introduction to it, and I want to tell you, anybody's invited to our meetings at this point. Uh, John Frawley, the uh, post commander, is our president pro temp. Uh, Tommy Russell's uh, on the board, too, as well as Joseph Galloway. Joseph Galloway is the uh, renowned Vietnam chronicler who uh, wrote the book, We Are, so we Are Soldiers Once and Young, and also made the movie. Uh, with uh, Sam Elliott and uh, Mel Gibson. So it's, it's rather a fascinating thing, but it's unfortunately been a, been a secret. So this is just to announce this is happening. And if anybody wants to contact us, you can either contact us through uh, Post 51, and I hate to say this, or you can contact me at john.stanley at att.net. And please, take the time to look at it. Um, my personal goal for you people, uh, just a little, my personal bit, is uh, to get the uh, not generically named North Cabarrus Park renamed to the uh, Vietnam Veterans Commemorative Park, and to have that uh, commemoration or dedication on November 13th of 2014 to kick off uh, this program. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, next, Ann Benfield. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity again tonight. I was here last month and I shared with you a little bit about child care subsidy in the county, but I wanted to come here personally tonight and thank you so much for approving the transportation grants for the county because it greatly impacts the families that we serve through the partnership. Um, tonight I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about brain development and brain science because I shared with you last month that um, there's 2,000 days between the child between the time a child is born and they enter kindergarten. And I wanted to share with you, um, I have some handouts today with pictures of the brain. Um, and, we, and I talked to you last month about um, a brain that was developed by, with a, by a child that had adverse reaction or uh, adverse conditions in their life if, if they're born with um, less fortunate um, family members and uh, don't have all the opportunities that a lot of our children have. Um, and I just wanted to bring that to your attention because I want you to understand that if we invest in children at an early age, we'll pay less money in the future for jails uh, because we spent, what, $60 million in Cabarrus County to build a jail, but um, we only have $2.5 million in early childhood and we know that if we get the first five years right, then maybe we wouldn't have to spend so much money on the other end. So I have this today, and I'll give it to Megan, and I really appreciate your time, and thanks again for the transportation grant. Thank you. Um, <laughs> ex Brittany Truesdale. Welcome. My name is Brittany Trussell. I am from the Animal House 4-H in North Stanley FFA. I showed at the Cabarrus County Fair this year, and when we arrived at the fair, it was really bad. There was cow poop on the straws. Before we could even bring in our lambs, we had to clean the pens, which was about 13 loads, and then as a, as a result of having to clean out the area, I was pushed to getting my lambs ready for show. I was sweating and nasty feeling. I could not do my best in showing from shoveling 13 loads of manure and taking out. No one should have to come into this before show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Susan Furr. Hi, my name is Susan Furr, and I'm the leader of Animal House 4-H. We have 10 kids that show. This year, as a result of coming into Cabarrus Fair, uh, we had five lambs that were held back from showing at two different fairs. One was uh, Dixie Classic Fair, and the other was NC State Fair, which our weathers go up for sale there. Um, we had two kids that lost over $700 between both of them, that's just for the cost of their lambs being resold at the state fair because they were not able to compete with these lambs, not to mention what they lost in premiums at each one of the fairs. When we came into the fairgrounds, it was stacked three high in poop. It was a layer of um, shavings, a layer of straw, a layer of beef cow poop, a layer of straw on top of that, a layer of dairy cow poo, and a layer of straw on top of that. And I won't bring my lambs into any conditions like that. Um, we stress to our kids at, in 4-H and FFA uh, about putting them in clean stalls and clean areas to keep disease from transporting from one animal to the next. Um, I asked them, did they have a wheelbarrow, a pitchfork, or anything I could clean the area with and something I could put down. I was told by Matt Barrier that they were shavings over behind these curtains and there was a wheelbarrow floating around somewhere and a pitchfork that I might could use. So I had to put my kids, before they went out and showed, to work cleaning their own areas. Um, this is really bad. We, come, we had five lambs to come down with, two to come down with uh, sore mouth and three to come down with club lamb fungus. This may or may not have happened because of the nasty area we came into. Um, but we were required to bring in health papers to this fair. None of our health papers were checked, nor were anybody else's, which our lambs could have come in contact with another lamb that caused this. These kids work from early in the spring 
until the fall of the year with these lambs. They can only have so many lambs that they show, and the lambs have to be tagged in early in the year just to be able to show at the state fair. As a result, I had two kids that went to the state fair with one lamb instead of two or three. And it's really bad. I asked Matt Barrier, I said, can you, do y'all not have a front end loader that you can clean up the areas with? And, no, we don't have that. And if we have to purchase one, it will cut into your kids' premiums. And I said, well, I'd rather for it to cut into their premiums than to cut into their cost of their lambs. Upon taking my trailer to the back remote area to park it, here sets a front end loader and a lamb. I took pictures of the areas that we came into that I would like to leave with y'all today. Um, it was really bad, and you can see my kids cleaning up. And like I said, you know, it costs these kids money. That They really don't have, these are not rich kids that are provided with these lambs. They didn't ask for sponsors for their lambs. They got out and worked to pay for these lambs. So, if you will hand those, or you can hand them right there to Jonathan. <coughs> And um, he can pass them up to us. Thank you. Uh, Marvin Balst. You look like you pay for the Steelers or something. No, ma'am. <laughs> My name is Marvin Balst. I'm from Mount Pleasant, a lifetime resident of Cabarrus County. I also here to speak to the fair. So, um, and I have a handout for each one of you commissioners to give you a sort of a summary of what we think we should be looking towards. It's called the Dixie Classic Fair in winston -Fale. It is a regional fair. The Dixie Classic Fair is a regional fair. As you can see in this brochure, the first thing of the Winston-Salem paper on Monday morning was Dixie Classic Fair, 328,124 people. In the Independent Tribune, I hadn't seen it yet how many people attended our fair at all. Also, you can see in this, they had two demolition derbies, two rodeos, one tractor pull, in which we have none of this at our fair, nothing. They have a restricted land space. We have more of a space than the Dixie Classic does. And though they utilize our space and do a lot with it, a lot. They have, you have to have things for the people to come in to see. It's just that way. And we understand there's a lot of problems with going in with dirt in the arena. But there's land along 49 that's a parking lot that could be turned into something that we could have the demolition derby, we could have the rodeos, we could have the tractor pulls, we could have the outside horse shows, instead of a ring in the middle of something that looks held together with bungee straps that we had this year. So I just ask y'all please to look at what we are and look at your numbers and let the people know how many people we've had. Go back to when it moved to the new grounds and, and compare it to now. This is one thing that I'd like to leave with you. We took $5,000 in sponsorship money and went to Stanley County Fair and put in a tractor pool and a horse pool. The reason being, nobody in this county either cared or wanted us to do it. So we had to go to another county to put this on. $5,000 in monies that came from businesses in Cabarrus County to go to another county. And we'd have, loved, we'd have rather had it right here at home to promote our own county. So, you know, Commissioner Troxler at his uh, speech at the last Sunday at the State Fair said, we need to promote agriculture. We need to promote it. And this is some of the only times that people in the cities, and here we are, just doorstep to Mecklenburg County, one of the biggest counties that we should be really tapping into. We should be at the 350 to 400,000 people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, Angela Beaver. Hi. Um, I also brought my students the next two cards probably up there with me. It's a strength in numbers thing. <laughs> um, and I also have some pictures to share with you all about what we're going to speak about. So 
if you can just pass them. If you want to hand them to yeah. Jonathan and you, which ones, who's Emma? Right here. Emma and Maddie. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, hello. As my email to each of you detailed on Thursday, I am a parent volunteer working with a group of parents and staff to secure funding to fix a long overdue problem at Northwest High and Middle Schools. In addition to the safety code issues that dictated last year's gym upgrades at Northwest, this 50 plus year old school has another pressing concern that the commissioners and school board have been discussing since 2004 as a priority. There is one track at Northwest. It is shared by over two thousand students from both schools on a daily basis for PE classes, run clubs, track teams from both schools and other sports teams at both schools to train. In addition, the track is accessible to the community and is highly used by groups like our JROTC cadets, RCCC law enforcement classes just a few miles away, and community members. This is a high use track that is in poor cracked shape and has substandard and unsafe unusable features that must be fixed. This project has been discussed and pushed aside in light of other priorities. It is extremely frustrating as a parent and a taxpayer seeing the disrepair of the track at Northwest, which also is the first thing you see as you drive onto our campus along the growing Kannapolis Parkway corridor. Our kids and families have waited patiently, but now is the time to act, act and we need support from Cabarrus County to complete this project. Now proudly, a group of parent volunteers and staff have researched, gathered information, asked permission, and written two grants to raise funds for this priority project. On November 5th, a national organization, the Jimmy Johnson Foundation, validated our work and recognized the priority of our project by awarding our school $65,000 to repair and rubberize our track. One of only nine projects in the nation to receive this award, the Northwest Community Track was identified as a critical need impacting many community members. With their donation and a Cabarrus Parks matching incentive grant also secured by our volunteer group, the track can be repaired. Our request to you today is an investment of one-time funds to help rebuild usable, safe, basic bathrooms, wheelchair accessible bathroom and track entryways, and basic metal bleachers for students and community members using our facility. With these items, both schools can hold meets, generate income from admissions and concessions, save transportation costs, and host invitational events, taking advantage of nearby Cabarrus County hotels and restaurants, and raising the healthful living standard of this part of Cabarrus County. Following in the footsteps of organizations rewarded last year for initiative to raise about a third of the funds for a field house and others who came to you about tennis courts in disrepair, if you will support the initiative of our volunteers and staff in raising about half the funds for the Northwest Community Track, Cabarrus County will see a return on that investment. And just as importantly, the students and members of the Northwest Community will finally have a safe and usable facility that at least meets the basic standards they have waited patiently for, worked hard for, and deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies, do you have anything you want to add? Um, you said a lot of words. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Hanna, Jr. from Northwest Cabarrus High School. Um, as Ms. Beaver said, a lot of students and other community members use this track to, um, for various reasons, such as uh, sports practices, PE classes, JR, JROTC, or um, community, community members just use it to exercise. Um, also, she outlined um, the current field house that we have down at the track is in uh, really poor condition. There's only two toilets, as you see from the picture, and there's like no locker rooms, nowhere to change, nowhere to put our stuff if it's raining. We also have no bleachers, um, so if it's raining, like we can't have, or if, like in any day we can't put our stuff anywhere except on the ground or if it's wet we have nowhere to sit to discuss after practice um there's also no parking lot near the track so for people who want to come and uh utilize our track um there's like some gravel that we can park on um and also if we had uh we're getting our track rubberized which is a great uh deal for us so we can practice and uh, it benefits all of everyone who uses this track. Um, but if we could update the facilities a little bit more, then we could use the track for meets, um, which would bring in uh, money for the school and other various ways. So, 
Thank you. Hey, I'm Maddie, and I'm a senior at Northwest Careers High School. Northwest is known to have a tradition of excellence and strives to train its students for successful futures. Within the past year or so, a lot has changed and improved at our school. We're beginning to grasp the modernizing changes of education and beginning to mold a school that is up to date with the evolving society. We have recently updated our baseball and softball fields, cleaned up and improved our football stadium, and, in, and have even built a brand new gym. However, our track facilities have been pushed to the side. As a member of both the cross country and track teams since my middle school years, I have spent countless hours on our track in order to improve my performance as an athlete. Although I and several other students have gone to the state level and have performed well, we need a new track and, and help it, and it'll help it be beneficial to our training. We need to update our track facility because it has been proven that the advanced athletic technology has affected the way athletes perform. We are a school that is dedicated to excellence, and with a new track and better facilities, we would indeed meet this expectation. Another aspect that has hindered our athletics performances are injuries. Yes, every athlete has those tugging, nagging side effects, shin splints, tight calves, or tendonitis, but then there are those injuries that can stop a person from actually running. This fall, I encountered my very first injury, a stress fracture. My injury was a hindrance to my performance this year. Injuries are very common on our team. Although we cannot fully eliminate them, a better facility and a better track will help us impact our performance and eliminate um, injuries. A new rubberized track will bring our school up to date with other schools in our county and help us improve our athletic performances. We will be able to maintain our tradition of excellence and help minimize our injuries on the team. As you can see, a new rubberized track is important for our school, and this is why we are asking you for your help. Thank you. You both did extremely well coming up in conferences. Um, next, I have Bobby McGee. Thank you, all you commissioners, for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Bobby McGee. I am here to speak about the Central Cabrera's Turf Project. Uh, this is very important to our community. I am a lifelong resident of Cabarrus County. I went to Central Cabarrus from 1987 to 1990. And I've seen the changes in our county with the new schools that have been built. And I'm very involved as Central as a parent of a student and the Booster Club president. I'm here tonight to ask for your support for the Central Cabarrus Turf Project. Our community already puts many hours and our own money into this field right now. I can't speak for the others who donate their time and finances, but me personally, I spend eight to 10 hours a week in my own personal finances to make sure these fields are playable for our students and athletes. <clears throat> the project is a great opportunity for our school and our community as a whole. We currently have the worst athletic facilities of any high school in our county, track, tennis courts, any facility, come take a look. I think that this project would help get our, our facilities back in order to where we can have some pride in our, in our school, our students can have some pride in our community. Right now, the Booster Club and our parents, we do a lot of upgrades. We've done all of the beautification products around our school with our own money. We haven't had any help to do these projects yet. <clears throat> we would like to see Central have something our own that our whole community can have. The other schools have got their own things. They've got their new field houses. They've got their new gyms. They've got their new tennis courts. Central's got nothing. This is a project for the whole community, not just for Central Cabarrus High School. Many benefits for this, uh, the project would have for our community is there are lots of youth organizations that could really use the space in the venue to be able to come out and play. We've, we've got very few spaces in the Southern Cabarrus County region, as you know. There's, there's very few places where our youth can go out and have a field to play on. Um, tonight, again, I come to ask for your support on this project. I ask that you carefully consider the positive impact this project will have on our community. And when you, while you're voting on funding this project, we are, central, we are Cabarrus County citizens that donate our time and resources. We would like to see something great happen at Central for our whole community. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, those are all of the um, informal public comment cards that I have received for tonight. Uh, next, we have old business, and we have Ben Rose here and 
Trish Baker, and you're going to come up and give us an update on NC Fast. We've brought Diane Gridley along as well. <clears throat> I'm going to pull up the Good evening. And thank you for allowing us to come and uh, present some further information uh, regarding our progress with our backlog in food and nutrition. It's probably hard to follow an act where you've been given a jar full of chocolate. So I wish we would have thought of that. Um, we have, uh, hopefully you have a, uh, the PowerPoint presentation on in, in front of you. So we're going to briefly go through this, um, not to take a lot of time to, to uh, go back on the history, but we wanted to give you a little bit of a historical context on how we got to where we are. Um, North Carolina FAST, of course, the purpose of this system was to basically consolidate all the systems that we have within our public assistance arena, Medicaid, Work First, Child Care, Food and Nutrition. We have about 19 different systems that exist within that area. The goal of North Carolina FAST was to consolidate it to one make it more user friendly, which we have had issues with that, make it more customer service focused. Um, part of the uh, goal in addition to that was to make access better for our clients. So we, uh, the, or the state has developed um, such things as ePass, online verification that helps our workers verify information. ePass allows uh, clients to apply online and fill out stuff without having to come to our office. We, were, we're, we would love to reduce the office time that we have to spend with clients and be able to process via uh, internet if possible. So efficiency, assessment, case management, all these were tools and purposes of North Carolina FAST that they were to deliver to us. Food and nutrition, it's been a rocky rollout for us as we, as we will cover. Um, but food and nutrition, we soft launched in October where we basically started taking new applications and putting them into the system. And then on February 15th, we, we were totally working in the NC FAST system, leaving our old, what was called FSIS system. Medicaid is to come out in uh, probably March is what they're estimating for us, um, where we will be hard launched, where everything in Medicaid will be living in NC FAST as well too. We have a, a slide in here as well. We just, this is a lot of information for you to just review, but this is going, uh, looking at the Affordable uh, Health Care Act. This is a part of NC FAST, and we are already having issues within this system because it is pending applications in Medicaid already, and the, and the, the Affordable Care Act has not even been rolled out in terms of rules and policies yet in NC FAST. So we wanted to share this information with you to show you how that will be incorporated as we move forward. We will be a big part of the uh, federal health care exchange once that site gets working, I guess, as well, too. Um, work support strategies is a grant that was received by the state. The purpose here, again, is to move us towards a universal model. When a client comes in in the, in the past, three or four years ago, they would see three or four different workers to basically get three or four different types of services. The goal eventually with NC FAST and, and uh, work support strategies is to get it to where one worker can handle all the needs for one, for one client and they won't have to bounce around in different systems. Simplification of rules, all those are hopefully goals that we will be able to achieve and be able to move forward with work support strategies. This has um, led to a lot of some strategies we tried a couple of years ago called case banking, which basically was a system where tasks were picked up in a queue by workers, where a worker didn't really own a case, they owned a task based on how it came up in the queue. And that was part of that system. Now with NC FAST, we're moving to a universal model worker, basically one worker, one, one family. So that's some information on work support strategies. We'll go on to uh, getting to where we had a rollout. When we went, when we rolled out NC Fast in February, some of the challenges that we had, as, as you can see, were screen delays, timeouts, white screens, white screens basically where the screen just goes blank, rebooting, where, which is if you've ever worked on a computer and it's kind of locked up and you have to turn it off and restart again. And we were having that happen, and sometimes the data would be lost that the worker had done, had been put into NC Fast. 
In July, we had Medicaid started to roll out, and we had a lot of systematic issues in July and August with NCFAS as well, too. So we had bumps along the, along the way there. But initially, screen delays, timeouts, and white screens were a big part of our problem. We, in May, we were getting reports from NCFAS. They were monitoring one of our computers. And one of the, one of the things it measured was how long it took to go from screen to screen. We noticed in May that we were one of the worst counties in the state in terms of time going screen to screen, as much as four minutes at some times. So if you can imagine a caseworker trying to enter and process a case in NCFAS and they have to touch 40 to 60 screens, and when they click to go to that next screen, it takes four minutes to get there. The system just was not working for us. So based on that, we got our county IT and we got NC Fast and we had a conference call because by that time we were banging our heads against the wall. There was a lot of finger pointing going back and forth between NC Fast and our IT. And we got everyone on a conference call and IT came into our department for about, I think about a 10 day period. And they really worked hard to get the system working for us. And we actually got that time down. Most counties were sitting around, I believe, I wanna say nine to 15 seconds. And there we were at three to four minutes. We got it down in June to about 10 to 15 seconds. So we were getting, we were getting it going. And then of course in July, we started to have the systematic issues with, with, Medicaid, uh, with the Medicaid rollout. But we got, we got some progress going on the technological side at least. Uh, Google Chrome became an issue. There was um, uh, a lot of chatter and the NC Fast world that Google Chrome as the browser was working better than Internet Explorer 9. And counties started to experiment with it. We, I believe in August, had Google Chrome installed and sure enough, lo and behold, the system works a lot better. And most counties went to that in August. Most counties were converting to Chrome, which did help us quite a bit. But as you can see, we had, we had such, so many issues those first few months that that backlog just got created. One uh, strategy that we tried to use early on in the process was, of course, we recognized that um, our caseload sizes have just increased tremendously over the past four years. I was talking to Jason last week about how the eligibility rules um, in 2010 were what's called categorical eligibility were kind of loosened, and we've seen our caseloads just explode. Um, and we felt like in February and March, as we were assessing where we were, NCFAST was again starting to give us issues. We were starting to see that backlog. And we have workers that were carrying over 600 cases and we felt like we just did not have enough resources there to meet the need. The, the caseloads when I came, I believe they were a little over 8,000 and now they're over 12 and that's been four years. So we did request 19 new positions um, to try to address that. We were able to achieve five through the budget process, but of course one of those was a fraud investigator, so we really didn't get many processors in, in that budget process. So as we got into the summertime, we started to work with the state to try to find different strategies to, to approach our backlog. Up here, as you see, our strategies, some of the things that we have uh, implemented, of course the phone policy that we, that we did bring to you in August, um, temporary staff that you've been graciously enough to uh, provide us for the past two months, and we'll talk about how, what they've done for us in a minute. We were doing a lot of voluntary overtime all along. Um, I think we even started when we still had the board and Chris was a part of those discussions. But we have done incorporated mandatory overtime now for the entire uh, economic services division. So for the past three Saturdays, we've been having as many as 30 people there on Saturday working eight hour days. Um, and we're, we've required 16 hours from each employee for the month of November and, and December to try to help us put as many hands on cases as we can. And of course, processors are the only ones in the end that can finish the case, so we're trying to get as many people in there processing as possible. Um, Mike has been really helpful in helping us get some county volunteers. Uh, Lundy uh, has been organized a website for other departments to volunteer for us, and they come and helped us on Saturday. And in addition to that, we have, I believe, three um, employees from other departments that have been redeployed to our area to help us free up some staff during the week as well. So that's been, that's been really beneficial. 
internally in DHS, we actually have two employees that we've redeployed from other divisions and other positions to, to help with this issue. They have started within the last few weeks and we're trying to maximize them as best we can. And these guys, when they get a new employee coming in, even if they're going to Medicaid, they're training them for food and nutrition to help, to, to help put out that, that, uh, that fire. So that's been some of the strategies that we've incorporated. Um, I'm going to let uh, Trish and Diane talk to you a little bit about stats, but two months ago when we were here, we were talking about a backlog as much as 5,000. We're now at under 1,700, so we have made a lot of leadway. A lot of that has been the use of the temporary staff and what they've been able to do for us that they will cover and show you some numbers there. In addition, the state being able to help us out with some cases by sending cases to Raleigh as well. But I'll let them cover some of the numbers that we've had with the temporary staff and then we can talk about where we feel we need to go to get this fully resolved. So I'll turn it over to these guys for now. The, the two charts that you have before you are, one is the um, expenditures for the temps and that's by week, um, and then the other chart is sort of their activity and how many temps we had doing those activities. And we pulled out the largest activities. Um, there were other activities that they did, like mailings and things like that, that would not really be countable here. But you can see that through the end of this week, we'll have um, estimated that we spent $40,000, just over 41, almost 41,000, and um, we, started out with seven temps on the week of September 23rd. We gradually added um, three more to get us to 10 by October 3rd. But then we started losing temps. They found other jobs. And we now have seven. Um, the temps started out doing what we call um, submitting applications. And what they did was we would, when it, because a client can apply either um, electronically, they can come in our office and apply, or they can mail us a paper application. Um, so the bulk of our clients usually choose to take a paper application if they can. And we're also under a face-to-face um, -face waiver, so we were encouraging, because we're part of a pilot, for clients not to see us face-to-face. -face. The state wanted to show that you would have same outcomes with a client as far as fraud and processing time if you didn't have to interview them. So we're part of that pilot. Um, and so what the temps did was um, we had a backlog of, of applications that needed to be submitted. So they took the paper applications, they keyed them in to NCFAST, and we trained that. And we took the first week of their um, time with us to train them just how to key into NCFAST. They were not taught eligibility because we presented before you that it would take almost four weeks to present. And with 30 days, we took what we could get them to do as quickly as possible. And so we, we decided submitting applications was a, a very good bang for the dollar, and it would get us to a spot where the workers could then take the NCFAST application and start working on it. So that's what the temps did. And while they've been here, they've submitted 1,672 applications for us. And on a f later slide, you'll see how many of those we get each month. They also ran online verifications for us. And what happens is when a client comes in, they provide us information, but we have to verify everything they tell us. So we have to run electronic checks. We also have to request information from the client when we can't get that electronically. But um, the temps did, um, I think that says 876. I need my glasses. 876 um, online verifications, and that's where they went in and they ran um, those verifications for us. And you have to do that on every recipient. So if somebody has a social security number, we have to check. We, you know, found folks who, you know, might not have told us about things that, and that's what the online verification does. Additionally, they were also taught how to look at what the client has submitted to us and say, this is what I need so I can process your application or your review or recertification, and they submitted um, or sent out 545 of those for us. Um, so together, those are all things that once the, um, the case is in, the online verifications are run, the verifications come back, then the caseworker can take it and actually apply eligibility. So they were doing everything they could up to the point of the caseworker taking it and processing it. So that's what we used our temps for. And we're at a spot where they have gotten us um, pretty much, we're working in 
the moment. So we feel really good about what we've done as far as submissions. Now we need processing. As you'll see, we're still not quite where we need to be on processing, but getting all the backlog, all that stuff that was sitting out there into NCFAST, those temps were instrumental in doing that. So we really appreciate all they've done, and um, they've, they've really been troopers with uh, learning today one thing and tomorrow we've got some more duties for you and we've done a lot of that. Um, oops, I keep going backwards. So the next screen you see are um, the applications and recertifications that we get and we did a monthly total just so you get an idea because it is a huge volume. Um, and the, to tell you where we were, as Ben said, we were, um, you know, 45, 5,000 um, actions applications and review outstanding when we started talking about this before you um, in July and August. Now we are um, right under 1,700 um, um, actions that are outstanding. And when I say actions, I mean applications and reviews, recertifications. And we've broken down by what month, where we're at, so you could get a true picture of where we are and, and what we're doing. We have 27 applications in July still outstanding, and as of this morning, we had 27. I was told by staff that before we left the building, we had 14, and most of those are because of NCFAST issues. When we had um, the rollout in July to Medicaid, it hung up a lot of stuff, and there are glitches um, that to the state is a glitch, and to us it's a case that doesn't process. So we've been working through that. Um, our August um, numbers in applications have also come down even since this morning because now that we're able to touch things in, in sort of more real time, the notices have to get sent out. The 8650s, which are the request for verification, get sent out. The client is then given 10 days to return that information to us. So we have now started tracking that and the temps will go back in and check our, our electronic system to see if that information's come in. If it's come in, it's put in a ready stack. If it hasn't come in and our reviewers from the county uh, provided us staff on Saturdays, they've come in, um, they've looked at all our work and said, okay, this is ready, this is, didn't come in, we can deny it. So that's where we're at and that's why we're able to be in a much better spot than we were even last month. So, I'm talking a lot, so if you have any questions or anything. I keep going the way. So, to summarize, we, we are still behind. Um, we're still experiencing issues with um, the NCFAST system, and now it, the NCFAST system, because of the rollout, is impacting the eligibility information system, which is a Medicaid sort of 1970s system. But we, um, try to key a Medicaid application and it says, no, it's supposed to be in NCFAST. And then you try to put it in NCFAST and it's saying, no, it's supposed to be in EIS. And so the workers are having to struggle through that. And in between, this client may be getting food stamps and it's put their food stamps on hold because of the back and forth that doesn't know where it lives. So we are daily dealing with those kinds of issues. Um, but as I said, we're, I feel really good where we're at. It's not where, you know, we thought we could be, but we are in such much better shape that, you know, we were all, like, really happy today when we started looking at our numbers. Um, so we're still um, experiencing issues. We, we worked this last weekend. We've been working every weekend. We came in on Veterans Day, a large uh, group of us. But the system wouldn't, it went down. At 11 o'clock, you couldn't do anything. We're having those kinds of issues. The state calls them latency issues, which I had to look that up, and that I think means a lag. You're not able to get the information in. But what we experienced on our end was a unable to log in at all uh, issue. So latency means, okay, it's working a little bit. Uh, we were not working at all. And we had you know screenshots where it said, you know, it'll, It'll be up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. And we're like, what? We have, it's 11 o'clock on Veterans Day. We, we're here to work. So we've had those kinds of issues. We had um, system being down um, two and a half days this last week. So NC Fast is still not fast. Um, but it, it's getting better. I mean, in a week, um, it's a lot better than it was, say, in July or May. Um, but, but we're not where we need to be. And a lot of that is because of the system. So.
And I think it's important to note too that just today there started to be conversation from with counties to the work support strategy people that NC Fast we're not ready to we're not ready for Medicaid. No, we're and not. They have actually been asking to suspend because things are just not built out, rules are not there, policies and policies are not there, and we really fear these same issues with Medicaid that we've had with food and nutrition. And that's a scary thought yeah. to us. We were told on a conference call last week that um, there were 156 applications that they could identify for Cabarrus County that were hung up in the federal marketplace that they can't get to us. So that's 156 applications that could very well be past due because this started October 1. Um, so we're already thinking, oh my gosh, we're, we're going to be in that same spot if if the state doesn't do something about NC Fast soon. So we are, we're struggling, we're doing what we can to advocate for our clients. We don't want to be here, um, but the state is, you know, still pushing, pushing forward. So that's sort of where we're at. Sure. Oh, wrong. I'm dyslexic. Or and our last slide is, again, talking about just going forward, how we continue to try to work out of this. And a lot of what we want to do is continue some of the same strategies that we have implemented, especially the mandatory overtime. Of course, we have that scheduled through December at this point. And if we need to go further into January, we can. Um, continue to volunteer program, continue to train new employees to help us with, with the backlog until we can get out of it. Um, we do feel like at this point, probably the current temporary staff that we have, I think we have used them to the maximum capacity. Um, our original proposal for temporary staff, and if you recall the letter that we got from Dean Simpson in September, was you know, to hire processing staff for several months. And you, know, you as a board did not want to commit to that, which we totally understand and, and, and respect. Therefore, we tried to use them as best we could within the small time frame that we had them. But right now, our need is, is processors at, at best. So if we, wanted, if we wanted to look at any additional resources outside of what we have going forward, we would probably need to look at a processing resource versus a support resource. Um, and that would be hiring someone that is experienced and is contracted temporarily that can come in and actually process cases in the system because that can only be done by an eligibility worker. But basically, we want to continue to most of the same strategies that we have because we are feeling like we're getting there. Okay, so on the last bullet that you have displayed, you have workers plural at an estimated cost of fourteen thousand and eighty dollars yes. to work through mid January. How many workers would that be? That is based on um, we shared with you, I believe, in in August when our original proposal that we're basing that on a company called Vanguard. Vanguard. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. Who basically have uh, ready processors that you can contract for. And that's based on their on their price. That's two, that's looking at two workers. Now we could go that route or we could potentially look at are there ways to maybe contract with other counties that have existing staff that might be willing to come in and do some time on Saturdays with us. There might be other alternatives to that as well too. But we wanted to give you kind of just a, a working figure to, to see um, if that was an option you wanted to consider as a board. You know, if we don't utilize that option, we'll continue to do all the strategies that we're doing and try to just, you know, claw our way, continue to claw our way out of this. Um, the, the Saturday work, I think, is making a difference. We've had three Saturdays, and when the system is working, we, we, can, we can make some progress because we have processors there that can do it. And then this had the second bullet, discontinue current temporary staff. So as of when will they be discontinued? Well, we, we would, you know, look to this week. implement we'd, that this week, yes. We'd wrap up their current projects and clean up that work and then release them. They, they have been a tremendous they help, have. there's no doubt. But with, again, with the short time span, we couldn't train them to process, so we put them where we thought we could use them, and they have really been a tremendous help because all of those actions that they did were things that the regular processors did not have to do, which, which would help, which has been a big help. Okay. Um, commissioners, do you have some questions? Um, Steve, you want to start? Do you have any questions? <clears throat> I was just curious how the cost of the temporary workers as compared to the, the overtime that you're incurring, and I do realize that there are some things they can't do, but does uh, uh, the blended situation that you have right now a little less expensive than 
going totally on the overtime and these contracted eligibility workers, I'm assuming they're better qualified and probably more expensive? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Vanguard, I won't keep calling them Vanpool, Vanguard, uh, the, at least the rate they quoted us in August was as high as $27, $28 an hour. And they even wrote in their letter, I think we actually submitted a letter to you in August, they even wrote that based on how North Carolina FAST system is not consistently working, the rate could be <laughs> a variable based on that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, is more, it is more expensive, but it is our need at this point too as well. Um, our, our need now is we've got cases ready to go, but we still have the same number of processors with our staff. And they're mm -hmm. basically the ones that can process. So if we can add a couple more hands to the, to the pot, we might could you know, help knock them down a little quicker. Right. <clears throat> and so would, would a, a larger number of them as compared to some of the overtime, I'm, I fear that you may start having morale issues if everybody's working every Saturday through the holiday season. Is that becoming a problem? Oh, you kind of I would say it is, although the, the staff, like this morning I had staff there at 6. They want to get these benefits done. So um, morale is low, but they also see, like I said this morning, we were like looking at our numbers and cheering ourselves because we've really, 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 you can really see a difference now when you look at where we were just a couple of months ago. So, And the client calls have diminished. The, the benefits, now we're trying to focus on who, who all can we feed before Thanksgiving. You know, we're, we're really pushing that now. And, you know, I'm going to commend my staff and all the folks who've come to help us. We've, they've done a great job. So morale is an issue, but they're willing to do it, and we appreciate that so much. <laughs> and so these, these trained eligibility workers should be able to move it along a little faster than the temporary. Well, Def definitely, because like I said, we've kind of used them to our max now right. in a lot of ways. Um, so now it's getting what they've done, trying to get it processed, and we still have the same number of hands on that. So if we want to look at additional resources, again, we can you know tackle it one of two ways. But I think that would be <clears throat> the best approach is to get people that can actually come in and process the cases in right. NCFAST, which is basically an income maintenance caseworker too. Right. Thank you. Yes. So with the the temporary workers that we have now that will be basically we've exhausted the funds that were appropriated uh, for those individuals that will end this week. And so with this um, contracting with the new workers just to process, basically they're going to carry through what the temporary workers had Accomplish to a certain work. degree, yes, Correct. because okay. the temporary workers have prepared a lot of the workforce, right. saving that time on the, that end, so they could help now move that work forward a right. little bit. Okay, whenever we um, discussed that with the temporary workers, um, I guess several months ago, was that a thought that perhaps we would have too many cases that uh, could not be processed that were I guess they're handling the application process, but then, you know, who would be processing the cases? Right. Then? Well, actually, our, our original proposal was for processing temps. It was for seven months, with okay. one month for training, six months for processing. Um, that, and that's what the state had recommended to us right. as well, too. So that was our original desire or proposal. But, you know, in, in right. regards it's to true. your your desire, it was to do it a more short-term basis. Correct. And with that, we just couldn't train them to be processors. We would have lost a month because it, it literally that would be a, about a four-week training process where we could turn it around and train them in a week to do a lot of supportive strategies which we had we did have that need as well too so right. um, I think you know going forward our need is processing now whether if we want to spend additional resources that's what we would recommend spending them on right. versus you know attempts that just Right. Do support stuff. Okay. And if we chose not to, to contract mm -hmm. the cases that haven't been processed, the current staff that we have will just try to work through those. Yes. What kind of timetable are we looking at? We I'll we would give an estimate. We're NC fast working, we're hoping middle of February at the latest. So it will take a little longer, but we are committed. Like I said, my staff like even this morning, how 
me are we touching. So we're committed. I just don't want um, anybody to think it's going to be tomorrow. Right. Um, but having, you know, additional folks who are trained, eligibility workers, it just knocks it down that much faster. So, but our staff are committed. We've got two staff from other departments who used to be food nutrition workers that they're picking up speed in NC Fast and they're helping us. So we're using every, we've used the training time at two, from two to five. Our IMC ones are touching a lot of cases for us too. They're making basic changes. So, you know, in, in a month or so, could we be in better shape than even I think? I hope so. <coughs> But right now, it's looking like February. And we've got five caseworkers in training right now that are getting there, too. I see. So we'll have five more that will be touching cases. But they're about three weeks out. Three weeks from out. From really okay. processing the cases. Correct. They're now getting ready to, they're submitting applications. So there, we've got five more getting ready right. to, okay. to join the processing. All right. Thank you. You said you had 1,700 applicants yet, yet to do, right? You're yeah. still behind. Uh, applications and reviews together. How far behind are some of those? Are they like um, well, two or three months, on, one month, um, or what? Page 13. Um, on page 12, we have 27 applications. That was before this morning. Now I think we have about 14. But the oldest is a July application. And they're about between 27 and 14, 14 and 27 of those. August is really where we're at um, for applications. They're making dents. So we expect by next week that we'll be touching and working um, October. So we're hoping to get in the next week with this Saturday up and running. Um, we've got plans to get a lot of those really old ones done. So, so you, we've get, got, you, got, you got people out there three months behind on getting their food stamps. Um, July, yes, the new applications. The reviews, we're working, we're almost done with August. So we're touching September in the reviews. The applications are what were hung up in, in NC FAST, and so we're working through those. Have they found out who set up that NC FAST system? <laughs> Apparently the company didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Must be the same people set up the health care plan. Uh, I don't know. It's a company from uh, Ireland. Ireland. From where? Ireland. Ireland. <laughs> First, I want to thank you very much for um, preparing this comprehensive report for us. This really helps us to understand the issues that you've been having us. We've been all becoming experts on NC Fast. We, we pick up some of it along the way, but this is exceptionally helpful to us, so I appreciate you spending the time to do this. Um, I want to thank a few county volunteers also by name because we have county volunteers this has been important to the county we have volunteers that are giving up their saturdays to go and work up there um and i want to thank those people by name it's mike downs pam dubois jonathan marshall bobby smith i don't think bobby's out here ann wilson uh, kasha thompson susan gray becky troutman and becky lewis and we appreciate your commitment to this. Um, and Susan Gray. Susan Gray. Okay. Oh, Susan, she's on my list. I skipped over her. Ambulance oh, billing. Oh, Janice Morrison Did, was Janice here last Tom? week. Janice Morrison. Yeah. She, she was not on my list. Sorry about that. I didn't see yes. her. There. She must have been hiding in a cube. She but, came in in her running suit and ran through her work and then went went on. So we, yes. They did a tremendous job. Well, thank you, too. I appreciate your commitment. Um, I have a question on page 11. When you have temporary staff activity, um, you have in the in the triple digits application submissions um, for most of the week except for four, and we showed no um, either application submission or OVLs or uh, request for verification in those four weeks. So I was just curious about those. Those were um, just sort of timeline figures to show that we went from seven, and then on 10-3, we added three, and we went to 10. And then on 10-14, we lost one, went to nine. 10-25, um, we lost another, went to eight. So those are just action. Okay. They're not um, weeks. The, I see. the weeks are in there. Uh, my question for you is, um, with the phone policy, um, how many people, how many staff do you have that are doing processing right now? We have eight workers who are dedicated solely to food nutrition processing. We, um, on last Friday, took uh, a group that's a change group. 
they were dealing with all the changes that come in, and there are well over a thousand a month that the client moves, they get a new job, they have a baby, somebody leaves their house. Um, we've put all those tasks to the IMC ones. Those five are being deployed to um, between applications and reviews, and they're going to be targeting the backlog. Is this the same five that we were talking about that will be ready in three weeks, or is this a different These five? Are, um, Those are new caseworker twos. The five that Diane was talking about are ones in training. The five that were that I'm talking about are ones that are existing staff, but they were dedicated to what we call a change team. Okay. With the universal worker concept, we had a change team, an app team, and a review team. And so we're blending the changes into um, applications and reviews or recertifications, and then the IMC ones are going to handle the changes. So the five that are in that category will be available immediately for processing? Yes, they cleaned up their work last week. They're, they started this morning doing, starting to do um, whatever their duty was, recertifications or applications. Okay. So it looks to me like we have eight that have been working through this process, right? And they have been able to accomplish um, 600 per month. Is that about right? Uh, ha, ha, well, ha, let's just look at it on a... How many per month could each person do, do you think, in terms of, um, let's look at just applications first, and we'll, we'll talk about recertification separately. The, with NC Fast Working, they were doing about five a day, and there are seven, mm -hmm. seven application workers. There are seven? Yes. I'm sorry. And one is in recertification, then? The recertification, when a, um, a case comes in new, uh, it's an application. Uh, when they're either a denied case or... Um, they're brand new to us. They're an application. And so we've got the application team, and we had seven workers dedicated to that. Okay. And then we've got our review team, which are recertifications, um, ongoing when a client has benefits, and every six months they have to submit new paperwork, and we have to go through the process again. So we had eight workers dedicated to the review team. Okay. And then we had the other workers dedicated to the change team handling all the changes that happen on those ongoing cases, those re review cases. Uh, but we've deployed those workers to um, one, did one go to applications? Yeah, we one to went to applications and the others are going to reviews. So eight and 12. Eight to the app, 12 okay. to research. Okay, eight and 12. And so when you said you had seven doing processing on that was um, application. applications. I, what is your name, ma'am? I'm sorry. Diane. Diane. Diane, nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, when Diane mentioned that there are eight there, and, and Trish, you said that there are seven doing um, the processing. What is the other person doing? Okay, so we have, we have three teams. One well, let's is, just talk about applications. Okay, applications, <clears throat> seven. There are seven workers there. We're adding a new one okay. as of today, and so they'll be doing the same thing that everybody else okay. was doing. Okay, so you will have eight. Yes, and they're, they're able to do about five per day when the system is working. Okay, so that's um, 40 a day times five, 200 a, 200 a week. Right. And so that should be 800 a month. Yes. Okay, and you are getting uh, 600 and change um, a month it looks like September was 585 October was 495 yes. so potentially this month uh, we could get done one and three quarters months if we had 495 if we, we could do October and maybe um, well we could do October we're hoping it, it, that we will get all of July August September done and be into October with the group that we've got now for applications well, we have 27 and 147 and 314, which is less than 500, for July, August, and September. Right. Which means this month we ought to be able to get through July, August, September, and a good chunk of October. We, we only have a week and a half left of, of the month. Yeah. I mean, just in the next 30 days is what I mean. Right. Yeah. Which would put us on time. If we could get through half of October, and, and our goal is a lag of 30 days, um, I guess we would be maybe 20 days behind. But um, but it does look like we can make tremendous progress on those. And we are. Yeah. We are making progress. Okay. So I think that that's an area where if our staff 
Um, and I actually only calculated that on a five day per week basis. And if they're working six days per week, um, you could really add in another um, 160 cases, which means we ought to be all the way through October in the next 30 days. Well, we're not asking them all to work six days a week. Okay. It's yeah. only every other week, so. Okay. And the other, the flip side of that, though, is that just this last week, we lost three days because of NC Fest. We came in on Monday. It went down at 11. We prepped cases. And right now, because we're behind, we have that kind of work. I had staff that came in this morning at 6 o'clock to do work. NCFAS was supposed to be up at 5. It didn't come up till 8. So again, every time we think we're catching up, then we have issues with NCFAS. It was down on Friday. It was down on Thursday. So we, we're hoping five a day, and that's why I was a little bit um, not as conservative with my guesstimate about when we would be done, because mm -hmm. if every week we have even a few hours of downtime, that's a loss of that many cases that you couldn't process. So five a day when the system's working the way it's supposed to be working, which hasn't happened as, as much as we'd like. Now, to move over to recertifications, I, I have a general question for you on recertifications. If you are currently receiving food stamps and you are put into the queue for your recertification, um, it's your t you have to get recertified every six months, is that right? There are some um, spe um, families that are in, they only get Social Security benefits. They live alone. They're a three-year certification, and they're very small. But the, the majority of our cases are a six-month certification. So what happens if you are due for a recertification, and the recertification lags as this person in August? Um, you're one of 48 from August. What is your situation right now with respect to your receiving um, food stamps? That we have it when the client contacts us, we direct them to the pantry. Many, many families, um, they're supporting each other, um, but that's why we're pushing so hard. Our staff has done um, collections for pantries. We have our own in-house pantry, um, and that's why we're trying to get the backlog. So their situation is not um, great, and we realize that, and that's why we're trying to get it caught up. Well, th they are not receiving food stamps, though, right, on their, on their normal time? Uh, no, um, they would have gotten their last benefit month would have been they got their food stamps in August. Okay. So um, they, because it's on an EBT card, they could have had a balance. Mm -hmm. um, some of our families save up and, you know, spend the money more for particularly the elderly. They save up their benefits and then they go for special occasions and, and buy, buy things like that. And um, we do restore those benefits. So it, if we process in November, we will go back and issue the September, October, um, and give any benefits that we would have missed for not processing it timely. Okay. Now, in terms of recertifications, you said that you have um, 12 staff working in that department now? Yes, as of today. We had eight. We added the others. Okay. So you were up to eight. That's the... And... Um, how many recertifications can each staff member do a day? We were figuring seven. Seven. So th we really should not have any problem with respect to recertifications. I mean, if we're going we're, from... We're hopeful, yes, I no, agree. Yeah. If we're going from um, eight to 12 and they can do more, we'll have zero problem with that. Um, I would say that with... It, and this is not including the five more staff that we have coming on board, correct? In two or three weeks, when, once they're, they're training, they will probably go to... Research first, mm -hmm. yes. So they'll probably be going to reviews first because it's a little easier to follow eligibility when somebody else has already done it. Mm -hmm. So it sort of gives you a guide. If you move them to recertifications where we really don't have a problem, can you push some of your recertifications up to applications? And we've, yeah, we've talked already about talked that. about yeah. Okay. We'll redeploy workers. So and we're looking apps. at that daily. I mean, we have like daily um, meetings. What with you know what what are we doing and. Who, you know, pulls people, oh, you can come in at 6, you go do this. And so we, we do that daily, and we're, we're staffing it on Saturdays. You know, we're, we're looking at it day by day, real time. So we're trying to make sure we get the, the most work done in a given day. Mm -hmm. Well, I am comfortable with the fact that um, on a five-day-per-week basis, I suspect that you'll get caught up very quickly. On a six-day-per-week basis, you'll get up ex – very quickly, and that's with the staff that you have now. To add five more in two to three weeks, I, I think that you'll get it done. I have confidence in your department. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. 
Hey, but what you are asking for for us to consider today is fourteen thousand and eighty dollars to hire two people, um, two contracted eligibility workers for input um, to work through approximately mid January, because that's what the, that's the need that you see. Based on to allow our staff some, you know, holiday. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I, I trust um, trust both of all three of you. I trust that your staff is working very hard, and I trust that um, based on the actions of this board the last two months, that you wouldn't come and ask for something if you didn't really think you needed it. So um, I'm glad that everybody's working hard and that everybody is doing um, extra. And I appreciate everybody going in on Saturdays and coming in early and everything else. You can't do anything if the system's well, not anything, but can't do everything if the system's down, and that's out of your control. So, And just, just one quick follow-up on that. We have been starting to see a lot more issues with the system, and we do have concerns that may continue as Medicaid rolls out. That's part of what was going on today with the chatter about let's put a freeze on this. So just do be aware that even if, we, if you approved two processors, if the system is down, they can't process. <laughs> And that's that's the one pitfall that we have in this, and we can't, as you say, we can't predict that. And if they're not able to process and they were there, what would you do with them? If we had other work like the temps had, we would probably give them that or we'd send them home. We'd have to because of the dollar amount we're paying. We would send them home. Okay. Um, I have not discussed this with, with the other commissioners. I have no idea um, what your opinion is as far as this ask. Um, with that said, I will make a motion that we approve $14,080 to hire contracted eligibility workers um, in light of the situation that they've been facing all along, and the funds would come from contingency. So I will make that as a motion. Um, if there's a second, then we can continue discussion. If not, then it will, of course, die for lack of a second. So is there a second? Okay, there's a motion and there's a second. Any other discussion? Anybody have anything they want to add? I would just like to add that um, I, I would like to see how the five new employees, I mean, we've just redeployed five employees. So we've just added five employees to this. We're going to add five employees in, in, um, in two weeks, which is going to be, we're going to go from, um, 15 to 25 employees um, so I would like to see how that how that uh, plays out a little bit before we fund something all the way through January these employees are going to come online in the next some are going to come online tomorrow and some are going to come on in two weeks so I'd like to see how that um, uh, what kind of progress raising your uh, um, total employees by 40 percent can have before we um, spend more money Okay, any other comments? I'd like to see them get the system fixed before we start trying to hire somebody else to take care of these situations. Anything else? Okay, there is a motion on the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. aye. Okay, then motion fails. Um, three to two. Um, I guess we'll see you next month. <laughs> Find out how you're doing then. We'll keep hacking. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. We do your appreciate your support. Thank, Thank you. Um, next up, we have the consent agenda, commissioners. Um, at this time, I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have, next up, we have new business. Susan, can I ask you, would you mind if we jump to number three, because there's so many people here from Central Cabarrus, and um, do that real quickly? Okay. Is that okay? Here from Hickory, but she said that Can you wait? Just I don't think that one will take too long. So I mean, I hope it doesn't. Um, commissioners, let's look at item number three: the um, funding request for Central Bears High School artificial turf project. If you will look at your seats, you have a handout um, which outlines the cost and where the revenues are coming from. Second page of that is um, from Global Soccer Ministries with a letter of intent showing um, their part of the project. 
uh, we spent a lot of time discussing this previously. The request for us is to fund $265,000 of this project. Um, any comments, uh, discussion? Who wants to start? Do you, Jason, do you want to start? I started on that side last time. Start with you. Um, I have um, probably the very first project that I, or, or issue that I was um, dealing with since I got started in this position was Central Cabarrus High School. Uh, Bobby McGee had sent all of the commissioners an email, and um, I don't know if any other commissioners went out, but I went out and he took me around the school, and um, and and that was a very enlightening experience to me in terms of. I had just come from an event at J.M. Robinson, and really to look at the disparity between the two schools uh, deeply impacted me, really. And, um, and probably every time a school issue has come up since then, I have advocated for Central Cabarrus High School. Um, I would say that probably on this board, there is no bigger advocate for Central Cabarrus High School. I sent a letter uh, last week to the school board and said, we need to get $5 million for re renovations at Central Cabarrus immediately. With all that being said, I would say that um, this is a difficult project for us. Um, first, I, I don't think that the, the county commissioner is the right place for this. I think the school board needs to deal with these issues. Um, I, I think that, that what's happening is the folks here are getting put in the middle of this. They go to the school board, and the school board doesn't want to fund it. So they tell them, well, you go ask the commissioners, and if the commissioners will fund it, then, then we'll get behind it. And um, and I don't think that's the appropriate way to treat people. I think these are issues that should be handled by the school board. And um, what continues to happen is um, we do not have any means of prioritizing projects. And so when you look at the needs in Cabarrus County, which are great for schools, and your school has a ton of needs, it really does. Um, they send us projects on an ad hoc basis, which means this month we'll talk about a, a turf field at Central Cabarrus and next month we'll talk about a rubberized track and you know eight months ago we talked about a field house at J.M. Robinson and that's not the way that we need to move forward as a community what we need to do is work with the school board and come up with a um, prioritized list so that we can go in order of what the priority is um, we've got 12 million dollars in roofs that we need right now and I know um, I, I talked to Principal Reimer earlier today she said Jason $265,000 isn't going to put a new roof on a building, and, and that's 100% right. But if you look at the projects that we funded on an ad hoc basis, tennis courts and, and the field house at J.M. Robinson, which is $300,000, uh, right before I came on, they were talking about putting a planetarium in or refurbishing the planetarium um, at a cost of $300,000. And this field, all of a sudden you're looking at $1.2 million, and that is a, a roof on one of these schools. And... Um, I think that the roofs right now have to be the priority. I think that um, our constituents continually ask me, Jason, we live within our means and you have to live within your means. And one of the things that we need to do in order to live within our means is prioritize what our expenditures are. And right now our expenditures have to be um, roofs and other real maintenance issues that are causing degradation at our school and are gonna continue to cause um, further expenses. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, the other problem that I just can't get away from is if we put this turf field in at Central Cabarrus um, and we pay for it, every high school in this county is going to come to us with another plan for a turf field. And um, that is probably a four to five million dollar capital investment. Um, we've been told that these fields last for 20 years, but I was looking at this letter of intent and you get an eight year warranty on it. Uh, and these fields, while we get the grant for the first one, the fields cost $800,000. And so potentially in 10 years, um, we could be putting in a new field and people say, well, that won't happen. The roof at J.M. Robinson is $2.5 million and we need to put a new roof on J.M. Robinson that, thir that is 13 years old. Um, so we need to be exceptionally um, aware of the capital costs and the maintenance of the capital costs that we put in. And um, I just don't think that we can afford to spend four to five million dollars on turf fields at every school, and I don't think that we can afford to maintain those things. Well, my concern is I thought these fields were supposed to last for such a long time, and to see an eight-year warranty on here, uh, and the other thing I think is this, this should be a school board issue 
I don't think it should even be before the county commissioners for the funds. I think the school boards, if it's going to be done, they ought to take the funds out of the school board's uh, funds. Looking over the project um, in detail, and I know I've talked to a few individuals from uh, Central Cabarrus High School. You know, I, I do understand the frustrations um, that you know you see projects going to other schools, as it was mentioned in the public comments that you know Northwest receives a gymnasium, uh, Concord's received some things, J.M. Robinson. Um, you know, there's a there's there is a big disparity among the schools and that is one thing that you know we can't so much help by modernizing every school you know because as soon as they're built they're going to um, in turn become older schools and it's going to happen but I do feel like Central Cabarrus has been left out in the projects now I do agree um, that there needs to be a new system created in which there's a priority of what projects should be funded and this should come uh, from the school board they're they're the ones that um, uh, you know are the experts of the schools their staff uh, rather than we discussing these one-time uh, projects every month there should be a um, alternative method where the school board would bring a request um, by their board and I think that should be the the proper way um, of bringing these requests uh, beyond but you know I do see a savings uh, it was mentioned that there's forty thousand dollars spent a year on maintenance with the field and with the artificial turf field uh, there will only be a maintenance of two thousand dollars you know see some uh, real-time savings in that so you know I, I do um, I do think that we will see savings from that and as I said, you know, I, I do feel that Central Cabarrus uh, should have um, have a project that they're proud of uh, since the other schools have received a numerous of other things. As I said, moving forward, I do believe that, you know, there needs to be a new process of bringing these requests. Um, but as of tonight, I'm prepared to support the, the artificial turf fields at Central. Uh, <clears throat> I look at it from the return on investment standpoint, and, and we've been provided with a good deal of information uh, showing some of the additional benefits that we'll realize. Um, as Commissioner Meesmer mentioned, the, the maintenance cost on the natural turf uh, as compared to the synthetic field uh, will give us a pretty quick payback. Um, I, I also agree that that this should be a school board decision. Uh, of course, the school board's funding comes from us. Um, so the, on, the only difference uh, in the process could be that we could give it to them and then they could decide what to spend it on. But I think we have received correspondence from the school board um, encouraging us to approve this project and, and giving their support of it. Uh, as I have said to, to folks that have written me in the past, uh, those folks are elected to be specialists in school matters. Um, schools are, are a big piece of what we do, but that's not all that we do. So I depend very heavily on their recommendation, and based on the school board's recommendation, I would vote to support this as well. Okay. Um, as I understand it, uh, you guys have done a lot of work trying to get some costs, some firmer costs. I was concerned at our work session that you were talking about all the grading that needed to be done and um, fencing and some different things, but we, you didn't have any hard numbers for it. And that's the part that worries me more is that um, you've got all these plans in place and then you came up, if you were to come up $7,500,000 short, what are you going to do? So um, I do think that you've worked as I understand it from phone calls I've received, um, that you have worked hard to um, nail down those numbers and get better estimates, um, commitments for in-kind services, if you will, from some of your boosters and people in the community. Um, it's also my understanding that the Board of Education did approve this. I do agree, and we have asked, we ask often, and we have received um, priority list from the school board of projects that are under 200,000 and ones that are um, over 200,000. 
Um, it is a moving list. It would be nice if um, things didn't happen that changed the order of those lists, that we could rely on those lists a little bit longer. I also think that um, I agree that um, any project on a school grounds needs to come to us from the school board and should not come to us from um, community members or staff members without it going through them and being vetted. Um, they know what's needed at their sites and that needs to come and we need we do need to work for a plan with the school board and I and I mean both school boards not just Cabarrus though that seems to be the focus lately but we need to work towards a plan with both school boards so that we can plan we have a five-year budget and we need to get a five-year plan from both school systems showing where the needs where I mean we know what the needs are but how we're going to tackle those needs so that we're not doing things every single month. Um, I would be in favor of the project um, if the motion is that um, the school system has to have everything else in place so that our 265000 finishes the project instead of starts the project, which I think they have in place, um, just because that's what this is for and that the, the funds would be limited to this particular project. Because um, as you go along and you pull out the, the bobcat and the forklift or whatever gets out there, you're gonna hit something that you're not really expecting. There's always something underground that you don't know that's there. And there may be a change in scope. And I just would like for us to know what's going on and, and that we can adjust and we'll be aware of what's happening as we, as we proceed. So um, those are the only comments. And I think that, um, as you said, return on investment is the term I was trying to come up with earlier. Um, based on your original estimate, we would be paying a third of the cost um, towards it, which would mean that if we wanted to do a turf field, we could get three if they have grants. My understanding from CVB is that there are other grants out there available to get reduced prices for fields. I've had two other principals contact me, certain that the other ones just haven't found my phone number yet, but um, I feel certain that we will get more calls. And I don't know, you know, I think we do need to come up with a plan um, going forward. I would rather see this one in place before we would make a move on another one to make sure this was in place and it actually worked the way that it's being proposed to us as far as another one goes. Do you have another comment? I just have a quick comment. Um, we've talked about um, the fact that the school board sent this to us, so they must be behind it, and, um, and, and then Commissioner Poole, uh, you mentioned that we're paying a third of the cost. We are paying two-thirds of the cost. I mean, the cost is $390,000. Our CVB, which is, a, which is a county organization funded by county tax dollars, went and got the grant. So um, of the money being paid, we are paying 265000 The school board's only paying 95000 and they have a fund balance of $6 million. So if this was a, such a priority to them that they were going to get behind it, they could easily fund this project by themselves and, and, and we wouldn't have any involvement in it. But I do think that this is a project that if we are willing to fund it, um, then they are happy to accept our money and if we are not willing to fund it, then they would not fund it. And um, for me, if we spend 265,000, we are talking about borrowing money um, within the next year to build schools and that is 265,000 that we are going to have to go and borrow because we've spent it here. And we're going to have to spend it on roofs and things like that. And um, I would just rather take the money and spend it on a roof than spend it on a field and then borrow the money for a roof and put the county further in debt. We, we owe $469 million in principal and interest. And I, I don't want to see us go further in debt. Okay. Um, is there, does anyone wish to make a motion concerning this item of the Central Cabarrus High School Artificial Turf Project? Madam Chairman, I would, <clears throat> I would make a motion that we approve the funding of the Central Cabarrus Artificial Turf Project, realizing that we will have savings over the long, ter long term. Um, the max I would include in that, that our, our maximum expenditure on that would be and what was that figure? Two sixty-five, two hundred sixty-five thousand uh, dollars, which uh, hopefully would uh, would would cover the cost. But sharing your concern of any cost overruns, that would that would be something that they would have to make up elsewhere. 
uh, but I do make that inform I do make that informed motion. Okay, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there is a motion and there is a second. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Aye. Uh, motion carries three to two. <clears throat> okay, um, I appreciate you guys being patient. Uh, next, let's go back to G1 which is the presentation of the fiscal year 2013 comprehensive annual financial report. Susan Farrington, the Assistant Finance Director here at the county. This is Erica Brown. She's the audit manager with Martin Starnes, Associates, our, our independent auditor. Um, tonight I want to present to you the um, 2013 fiscal year comprehensive annual financial report. You'll hear me refer that to as CAFR. The document is prepared with great pre precision and involves a long process with the help of the majority of the finance department. I want to thank the finance department employees. Without their help, we would not be able to get this done each year. The process begins in April when the county's um, independent auditor comes out and they will review our county's internal control procedures. They test receipts and disbursements and work closely with the Department of Human Services, testing their federal and state funding. During June, July, and most of August, the county's busy making sure that all transactions are recorded in the proper fiscal year. Each receipt and, and invoice is reviewed at the department and the finance department level. Schedules are also being prepared for the final field work performed by the auditors during the last week of August. During August and September and a portion of October, staff are busy creating the CAFR, which we have before you tonight, that is being presented. The management is responsible for the preparation and the fair presentation of the financial statements each year. After they're prepared by the county, the uh, auditors will review the financial statements, and then we submit it to the LGC for approval. We did receive approval on November 7th, so just, just currently um, this year. And once the board approves the CAFR tonight, it will be posted to our county's website for the general public to view. After this time, the, um, the, during December, I will uh, get everything together and we'll submit it to the GFOA for award um, application. This uh, 2012 was our 28th consecutive year receiving the CAFR award. And the document is about 160 pages long, so there are a lot of detailed schedules and narratives and some things like that. But tonight, I just want to focus on three different schedules and it, before you have your packets. The first thing is the, um, the balance sheet. And of course, the assets and the liabilities and balance have to equal. And um, as you go down, you, know, you, can, you can see our cash and our liabilities, our different things that we owe, and also the fund balance. And that's always the thing that a lot of people want to hear about is our fund balance. I will take a, time, a little bit of time, a couple slides later, to talk about fund balance. So at this time, do you see anything that you would like to ask me about about the balance sheet? Okay. Going on um, is our income statement. And there's been discussion, I think I've already been um, told that we had a um, surplus this year of the 19, um, 19 million dollars. That's also detailed on this schedule. The revenues um, have, we show the budget here, the actual and the remaining amounts. There's by category and then expenditures are by different functions within the, within the county. It goes down and like I said, it comes down to the bottom of the page where it shows that we had a net change in our fund balance of 19 million dollars. Any questions on that? So the biggest change is under other taxes and licenses. Mm -hmm. Go back to the back of that page. Now, you're talking about the revenue, correct? Yes. That's our sales tax. Okay, so. We um, actually had a new, a full year of our new um, quarter cent sales tax. And so that was a big portion of it. We did, um, we did not budget a whole year we should have. We budgeted eight months. So that was the part of our um, surplus there, but also we did not have as many refunds as we did in, in prior years. Tax refunds that go to our um, nonprofits, hospitals, um, different people who are, submit for refunds, and that comes out of our pot of money. But they did not have as much as in prior years. Sometimes it can fluctuate. Um, we've had as high as $7 million in refunds, and another year might have $2 million. So that's a $5 million swing right there that's unanticipated. You just do, you, we've tried to get information from the state, try to project things, things each year, but when it fluctuates that much, it's just hard to, hard to estimate. But you know, the economy's getting better, so we're seeing in, even this year, sales tax is coming in good. So, so far this year looks good. So it's, part of the, 
part of the problem was that in the budget process last year, we budgeted 75% instead of 100% for, sale, for the new sales tax number. Yes. And then um, there have been more sales purchases, Correct. so therefore the number went up. And we try um, to be very conservative in our estimates so that, because we don't want to over budget it and right. not collect as much. So you're very conservative. Most years we do have um, fun, more money in there because you do take a conservative stance Correct. on revenues probably, when I'm you thinking say that. Back, probably maybe two or three years ago, we did come in under budget because of the brief funds, which was a huge hit for us. I mean, when you see the buildings going up at the hospital, all the construction stuff, just think about that sales tax they're getting back. So that's what hurts us a lot. Okay. Um, any other questions, commissioners, on? I, I just, this says that um, for the fiscal year 2013, we had a $19.7 million surplus, is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. On the next page, this is the page that a lot of people like to talk about, is our um, fund balance. We have a total fund balance, and that's, uh, like you want to consider like our savings account, of $95 million. But um, we cannot spend that whole $95 million. There are certain requirements that we have to set aside the money. For, for example, there's a small amount for inventories and prepaid items that are non-spendable that we cannot commit. There's also the stabilization by state statute. It's a state requirement. It's, you know, really our receivables. We cannot spend that money, so it has to be set aside. And then we have um, assignments of fund balance. That are, those are things that management thinks that we need to set aside that we possibly could spend when we'll need that. It's like a rainy day for different things. And we've got the assignments listed here for um, in different categories. And also the one big thing I want to point out is the $32 million here. This is our 15% of working capital we have to maintain for cash flow purposes until our tax uh, revenues start coming in. And so we need to keep that amount of money in, in our um, fund balance. So at, with all that being said, we take away the, the total fund balance and all the non-spendables and restricted and assignments and our working capital, then there's $29 million that is available for um, appropriation. Any other questions right now? I, I did want to thank staff again because it's very, very important. It's not a one-man show. That it takes a tremendous amount of time to get everything ready for the auditors and to produce this document. Um, it gets reviewed several different, you know, even in Erica's office, it gets reviewed several times. The LGC, you know, looks through it. So it's a, it's a lot of work. So I'm going to turn it over now to Erica Brown, which is Martin Starnes, our independent auditor. Her slides. Good evening. I just wanted to start by thanking you for letting me present to you today and also thank you for the relationship that we have to, to audit the county. We, we don't take that relationship lightly and we do appreciate that and look forward to working with you for years to come. I also want to thank Susan, Shelley, Ann, and, and all the staff in the finance department. They do an amazing job. They're always well, very well prepared for us and that makes my job easier. So I really do appreciate what they do. Um, and Susan did a great job explaining the audit process. I'll talk about that in just a little bit more detail. For those of you that aren't familiar with the audit process, we may only be in this building um, once or, or twice a year, but we're always, we're continuously working with the finance department. We read your minutes monthly to see what's going on within the county. We're always uh, assessing any new debt you may be getting, any grant issues or anything like that, and we're always discussing internal controls and things of that nature. So no longer do we, we finish the first year's audit, but we're always starting looking forward 
and planning our risk assessment for the upcoming audit. We perform our interim procedures in the spring, and as Susan said, this is when we come in and we look at compliance with your DSS programs that's required for us to do. And we also look at internal control procedures, and we also do some cash walkthroughs at various points throughout the county. Then we come in at the end of August, and this is when we are testing the actual account balances to the supporting documentation and working with the finance department as they begin to draft the audited financial statement. Um, once that's all finished, we do issue our opinion letters and we submit the report to the Local Government Commission. I'd like to give you a brief summary of the audit. We did issue an unmodified audit opinion, which is in layman's terms, this is a clean opinion. We had no financial statement findings, but we did have two federal and state award findings that I wanted to talk about briefly. Um, the first one was when we went out to the DSS department, uh, we noted that there were several computers in the DSS department that were not logged off the state system. And this is one of the required procedures we have to look at when we do this compliance testing. Management has addressed this issue and has advised staff to lock their workstations when they leave the work area, and I believe this will be and has been communicated in staff meetings. Um, the second item that we found is the supervisor review of day sheets was done but was not documented and therefore we could not, um, without that being documented, we could not test that that review was done. And um, again, I believe that these procedures have been put into place since we had this finding that we noted in the DSS department. And I know that is a very brief overview of just some highlighted points, but I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Any questions, commissioners? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Also. Okay. The next item we have is uh, G4, uh, Jonathan Marshall. Madam Bobby Chairman. Smith. Yes. You need sorry. a motion I'm, to accept apologize. the report. You're right. I'm sorry. We do need a motion to accept the fiscal year 2013 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report as presented. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next we have um, Jonathan Marshall and Bobby Smith. Is Bobby here? Hiding. Um, Stephen Langer is here. If you, have, <laughs> if you have any questions of him. But this was an item that we had brought to you at your work session for your input. Um, we had some, I believe, overall consensus and averaging as we looked at this that to look at examine two emergency hydrants for the Northeast Fire Department and um, actually when Stephen worked with our GIS division to map that we found that we could cover 70 percent of their district within the radius we were looking for with the with two hydrants on 49 and really the remaining part of their district that we can't cover is because of its distance from 49. So, so really any other hydrants on 49 wouldn't, wouldn't aid in that. So we would be looking at helping them with some dry hydrants for those areas. Um, we are in the process, I've, I've taken the maps that they created from that and have forwarded those to the City of Concord engineering staff who've already given us some feedback. So we're looking at some of the other issues that are related to that, where that would be located, um, room for for the actual tanker to load the water um, and whether or not we need any additional right of way. So we're continuing to move forward. So at this point, if, if you're still comfortable with, with us pursuing the two hydrants, we'll keep working on the planning and engineering for that, working with the Northeast Volunteer Fire District. Um, this would ultimately <coughs> result in, we'll come back to you with a total cost for this, as well as a four-party agreement, which would be necessary between Concord, Kannapolis, the county, and Northeast Volunteer Fire Department. Okay, so from tonight, you want to know if, if we want to go forward with the two fire hydrants, correct? Still comfortable with us pursuing that, then we would move forward with that and bring the, the final plans and plans, costs, and agreements back to you when they're ready. Okay, Steve? Have you had any additional, I mean, the folks out at Northeast <clears throat> Volunteer Fire Department are good with this? Um, Stephen has, has been communicating with those. Stephen Langer, our fire marshal, so he uh. could probably answer that better, but... Well, I'll let him do that. They must not be terribly unhappy or we would see them here tonight. Yeah, I've uh, spoke with them through emails with the uh, board president and the fire chief. And, um, you know, the fire chief expressed, you know, gratitude in, in working to try to bring the hydrant. So, 
you know, whatever they can get to help them with protection, they're, they're happy with and happy with the intersections that we've looked at. Right. The other, other question that I had, I think I misunderstood when we talked about this at our work session, but, you know, we, we had some discussion about the, the fencing and the locking the hydrants and so forth and the possibility of theft of water and that kind of thing. And in some additional conversations I had, the issue is not so much that, it's more a potential uh, contamination of the water, should somebody choose. I mean, that's the reason for the security. Is that correct? That is part of it. It is also to make sure that it's only being used for fire training and actual firefighting right. use. So it's both. Because it is a remote area, so there is a security issue with, with being able to tie into those lines with any contaminants, but also that it can only be used for the firefighting, right. which we will advertise heavily because I think as someone, one of the commissioners noted, you, you do see on some systems metering and use of water by pressure washing companies, other private companies. This will not be available to them, right. only for the firefighting. Great. Thank you. Well, it appears to me that not much has changed since our last uh, meeting two weeks ago, and I was fine with it then, so I'm I'm fine with it now. Yes, I'm good with two. My my only question was uh, there was a question of whether um, these two fire hydrants would fit within our right of way, and that um, which would allow us not to have to acquire any more land for this. Have you um, been able to figure out if that's accurate? Um, that was one of the concerns that we're going to have to to study further, particularly one at one of the intersections, and I believe it's the one at Lens Harness Shop, there's some topographical issues where we would need to, to get a little bit further off the road, and that could require some additional right-of-way. Um, the other option that, that I'll then explore with them is, is whether or not it's possible to bring, because this will be tied into the line, but, but have a lateral, and whether or not it's possible to bring the lateral to the south side of 49 where there is right away available. So those are some of the things we'll explore when we get you those total costs. Okay, good. I'm good. Okay. So I think we're good with two, Thank and uh, we'll look forward to get your information. <coughs> um, the next one we have is the requested changes to the flow store fire protection contract, as you remember from our work session. Um, there was a request to change the contract um, Jason, I'll start with you. Any comments? I do have comments, actually. I um, went after our meeting. We, we spent a, a good bit of time on this at our meeting, and, and probably more time than um, what most people would think was necessary. But through speaking with Mr. Nichols and, and speaking with um, um, Mr. Langer and, and Bobby Smith, um, it, it just occurred to me that there was some, some ground there that I thought that we could um, come to and, and respect uh, Flow Store's autonomy, they are a proud serving volunteer fire department and um, also um, achieve what the, um, what the county was looking to achieve in terms of um, um, having some accountability for tax dollars. And um, I, I start, talked to Mr. Langer and um, Bobby Smith on the telephone last week and talked to them about a, um, a compromise here. And um, I proposed to them that um, um, we set a threshold at which um, the flow store would have their own autonomy and they could purchase things and um, above that threshold um, they would have to come and get approval and um, our, our fire guy said that as long as um, air packs were not included within that discretion and that was for purpose of having uniformity and for some OSHA requirements that, that they would be happy to be flexible with it. I spoke with Mr. Nichols and he said that he would be flexible with it and um, so they both agreed that at 50,000 up to fifty thousand uh, dollars, excluding air packs, um, Flow Store would have the opportunity to buy anything um, after consulting. But um, I just want to look at the language here. Um, but but not approval, consulting, but not approval for up to fifty thousand dollars, and then for fifty thousand and above um, and air packs, they would agree to um, get prior approval from the county fire marshal's office. So I, I thought that that was a fair compromise and. I'd propose it to the board that we move forward that way. The volunteer fire department, I don't have any problem with them making their own decisions. I think they should be allowed to do it because they're volunteers, they're not paid, most of them aren't. And uh, that should be up to each fire department as to what they want to do within, you know, they, they have to do certain things. All fire departments should do the same thing as far as buying equipment. 
but they should be allowed to make their own decisions, I think. Um, my only comment would be that um, at this time, all the other volunteer fire departments have agreed to the same contract. So um, I don't have a problem with your proposal. I just think that that should be a part of everybody's contract. And if we can go through this year with the same contract that everybody else has approved and then make the change for next year for everybody, I would feel more comfortable with that. Um, I think it's been, you know, the, everybody else, everybody's talked about it and um, approved it other than Flow Store. So that would be my only, my only thing. I think we should, if they are, if, if I forgot how many there were, if they've all signed it but one, then I think that if we can get through to, is the date, the date on it, does it go July 1, is it fiscal year, or what is the dates of the contract? The other contracts, when did they? Okay. I presume it's fiscal year, so it will run out June 30th. It is, but the contract, I believe, right now is perpetual, so we will have to address it and send new contracts out come June with the changes. Right, I understand that. What I was saying is that this current one, everybody else is in the same one until June the 30th. So Actually, I guess... yes. My request of Flow Store would be, you know, unless you think you're going to buy something huge between that's going to be impacted by this, um, to use the same contract as everybody else, and then come July 1 to add your phrase in for everybody else. But at this point, um, it looks like you want direction. What kind of a there's, there's several people from Flow Store motion do we? Yeah. At, Nichols, you want to come and up? Chairman, I would say that I talked to both Bobby and Steve about this this precise issue today and they didn't have any problem doing this at this time for um for flow store flow store has an outstanding contract that they haven't signed and um there had been some other grumblings from other departments and um one of the things that we were able to discuss was the fact that this would be a workable um solution for all of those departments um that they could all basically opt into this and um we could do that uh, if the other departments require uh, or, or are interested in opting into this immediately, you could do it with a very simple amendment contract. Rich could do it in less than a paragraph, and they can opt in, or we could wait until July 30th or June 30th, and when they want to resign theirs, they can they can opt in at that point. But um, And I don't think it's an issue of a big purchase. I think it's an issue of, of little purchases right now. The problem, if they wait until June 30th, all little purchases, they have to run through the fire marshal's office, and they will make some of those, I suspect. And um, that, that, I think, is really the pressing need for doing it now. I, I don't know what motion is before us to, to make. Are we actually making a motion, or are we just giving direction as far as the consensus Mr. of Nichols the board? has requested for your review you of your, the... Okay. Mr. Nichols has requested for your review of the contract to amend the language to the contract. So uh, you would either make a motion to amend per their request or make a motion to not amend or deny the request. Do you want to add something, dear? No, I don't. Um, we discussed it at length at our uh, planning meeting. and. I believe in working with Jason. The compromise that he suggested uh, is workable. <coughs> I understand your position that you would like to see consistency amongst all the contracts, but at the same time to modify that contract and have 10 of the fire departments sign off on it, I don't really see it as any big deal. But if you decide that you would uh, prefer to leave the contract as is, with an agreement that it would be changed to give us the latitude that we need to make some decisions uh, with the next contract that hopefully will start in June, uh, we're prepared to accept that. It would start July 1st. Yeah. Yeah, run through the end of June. So. And I will add that, you know, we have established a subcommittee from the chief's group uh, on the contracts and um, we'll be actually having our first meeting in January to go through the contracts and the fire study and the recommendations from the fire study and uh, make sure, you know, all that's addressed and covered in the contract. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be some more stuff that we'll, we'll have to bring forward to change. So that shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, and, and I don't disagree that, I mean, I think that's a, it's a, it's a good suggestion. I think um, we were at a point where neighboring departments were doing things so differently from each other that when, there, when multiple departments were called in, 
that you know there was a real problem, especially as as I remember with the um, with the oxygen, the air tanks and everything, because they didn't they were not compatible. So I know you've been working really hard to try to get uniformity, <coughs> so that um, you know so that you can be able to help everybody else and. More importantly, I guess, if somebody else has to come and help you guys, that you guys have it. So, you know, there's there's a reason behind it. Um, at, at this time, commissioners, as you've heard, we just need to decide how we want to proceed. So, I, I just have one more question for Mr. Nichols. Do you have a preference in terms of would you like this contract to have the terms? If you don't care at all, we'll put it for June, July 1st next year. If you have a preference for this year, then I'll make a motion to do it for this year, whichever your preference is. I think we can live with either decision. Uh, there's nothing that we anticipate purchasing immediately. Uh, and I trust that the fire marshal's office will work with us in the meantime towards any equipment that we need to purchase. So I'm, I'm comfortable in waiting until the next contract. Okay, we need to have some type of a decision made. Well, I, I'm assuming that if, if they're good till then, if we do nothing, then it will automatically come back up when those contracts are to be renewed, correct? What we would do now is then give them the contract that we had uh, created and have them sign that contract and then uh, come January do a new contract. Right, and, and so then when it comes before us for a vote, we'll have a contract that has input from all of the chiefs of all of the volunteer fire departments, so it would be consistent with each one. That's correct. Correct? So... Uh, yeah, that certainly would be my preference that we do nothing until that time, unless we need a motion. So we'd have a new contract July the 1st, is what, it, that's where you would. July 1st. That's, that's what I mean. July you said 1st, January. July. I just want to make oh, sure I'm we get our dates July right. That's okay. 1st, yeah. um, we sent it out in January. We had three J months, and we, <laughs> we've, we've hit all of them. So um, July the 1st would be where everybody would look, and you would have time to get this language incorporated in there. And I think, I think that's a very good compromise. I'm not saying that that's not the case. Um, I also know that, you know, we do need to have some uniformity. And I do agree that their volunteer fire departments, um, they're doing it as, um, I don't know if this is the right term, an arm of the county. I mean, if they weren't there, we would have to have fire department. Right. So um, I do think that everybody has to work together. And I have complete confidence that that's the case and that, um, you know, that we can move forward. So. Commissioner Moore's suggestion is that we, um, do we have to have a motion to deny the request no, to change? Rich, how would you feel then? Rich, or do we, what do we do? Well, I think you can do it either way uh, by taking no action or, um, or voting not to change the basic contract. I think it's really up to Mr. Nichols. If he's representing that they're going to go ahead and sign the standard contract, then I think it takes care of the issue in that way, actually. If that's, and they're going to look at the new one when it comes up uh, next July. This contract actually doesn't have a term to it, but it does, it does have a provision in it that either party can terminate it for any reason on 90 days notice and for cause on 30 days notice. So it's, you know, if there was some issue that came up, um, they could certainly ha have those options as opposed to uh, just signing a new one in, in uh, July of next year. I would say that I have no desire for Flow Store Volunteer Fire Department not to be in existence, okay? <laughs> that would be a bad thing if you were not in existence and you're not out there doing what you've been doing for this uh, quite a long time. I don't know exactly the number of years, but for Neither quite a long do time. we, and, and I, in, in reading the fire study, I don't know how many of you, uh, because it's been out for a while now, but the volunteer fire departments, according to the fire study, uh, save this county approximately $19 million a year uh, because of the volunteers that we have providing the services that they do. So, uh, you know, that's why we, and the community has spoken very loudly to us that they would like to keep these decisions with the community fire department. Um, and so we appreciate your working with us on it and we look forward to the contract changes for next year. And if I can take a moment, I'd like to recognize other members of the Flow Store Volunteer Fire Department Board of Directors that we have with us here tonight, Tommy Lauder and Aubrey Hagler. Uh, and I don't know if there's any community members here or not, but uh, they were planning to show up. But with the compromise offered by Jason, I think decided to stay home and watch the Panthers game. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's understandable. Anything else you want to add? So are we okay with just not doing any action yep. and going forward? I'll just and say thank you to you both of you, men. Thank yeah. you for your flexibility. It was a pleasure you to work with both of you. Obviously know that our intent would be in the July, July the 1st to add this into the contract for all of the volunteer fire departments. Yes. Okay. And that is ours as well, to maintain consistency amongst the contracts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have item G6, uh, the request to approve Midland Library concept. <coughs> Dana, do you want to talk about that? I actually, I'm going to introduce our delegation from the <laughs> Midland Town Council. Um, we have with us the mayor of Midland, um, Kathy Kitts, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Mike Talent, and the town administrator David Pugh, and so I'm going to let them come up and talk about their project. Thanks for having us tonight, and I appreciate your support of Central Cabarrus High School, too. Um, all of it is important to, to our council and our community. Our town hall project, as many of you have seen and, and some of you came out to our groundbreaking, is going to be a um, cornerstone for our community. And the plan is for it to be a 16,000 square feet um, facility and having our town staff and our chambers and everything on the ground floor. Um, the second floor, one half of it being over 3,000 100 and some square feet, I'm looking at data, 3,100 um, square feet of library space. And many of you have known me for the eight years that I've been involved in council. And this is a project that we've been wanting to do for quite some time. And the, the town is um, working on the project itself, uh, building the building, doing all the groundwork, doing all the other things. Um, the Friends of the Library have been formed for our uh, Midland Lab Library. We are working on various projects, getting ourselves going, getting our bylaws and all these other things done as well. Um, myself and Mike Talon are uh, part of that group. And we also have um, a lot of fundraising opportunities to, to, to raise funds for the upfit of the uh, facility. Um, and the, the town is going to be doing the hallway, the bathrooms, all of the other things on the second floor to, and the elevator and all the other key things that we've got to have. The Friends of the Library is responsible for the inside of the building, uh, in, of the space, and we will be doing the um, paying for the drywall and on all the interior and everything. So our request to the, count, uh, to the county commissioners is to consider in your upcoming budget um, to fund the positions that are needed in order to um, work the library, run the library, and we will have volunteers that are coming out of the woodworks. Um, wanting to help out in the library space. So we, we ask that you please consider this request. Um, the town is willing to work with you on whatever other dynamics we need to have as far as discussion on what goes in the places and all that stuff. Dana is very um, apt to, to talk to us about those things and make sure we're doing the right stuff. Um, and we brought her in early on to make sure we're doing the, the right setup and the right, um, I guess, structure uh, for a very nice library for the uh, residents of Southern Cabarrus County. Um, we've made it known that it is not just for the town of Midland. Um, it is for the residents of Southern Cabarrus County that have to, one, pay $25 to go to Stanley County and, and the Locust Library to get books or they drive to, to Harrisburg or they drive up to Concord um, so and Mint Hill so they go to Mecklenburg County as well so you know this is this is a um, huge project for all of us and I hope that you will uh, consider that that funding for those those individuals and what they need in order to run that facility anything else you guys want to add? Um, just the I, I, uh, Mr. Downs did did they receive a copy of the motion that council um, passed? Because I know we wanted to get a, so they, Dana, they did. Okay. And council, just uh, just to uh, reiterate, they did pass that for um, nothing. So it yes. was unanimous. So any questions for me or the rest of us? Jason, do you want to start on this one? 
Do you have any comments or I, questions? I think when we had talked about this at the work session, it was just um, there was a lot of uh, moving parts to it still in terms of how are we going to um, allocate costs amongst the town building. And it, it, we'll and work that out as we come to it. Absolutely. There's, and, and there's no answers to that right now, Jason. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, if I had answers to that, I'd be rich right now for, sure. for a lot of things. <laughs> that wasn't uh, um, a problem that I was having with it. Just um, my, my understanding from, from the uh, work session was that this was basically an agreement to move forward with the concept and that we were not um, um, talking about any particular numbers at this point. And um, I, I support this project and would love to move forward with it. Thank you. I'm in support of it. Don't have any problems with it whatsoever. Perfect. Uh, just as we discussed at the work session, uh, you know, I'm prepared to move forward, and I know the details, you know, haven't been worked out, and I don't right. think that anyone's, you know, want to discuss that this evening. But I, I know the staff will work on that and right. look forward to seeing the plan. Perfect. Well, I have the pr the privilege of serving on the library board mm -hmm. as well as being the liaison to Midland so to both of you job well done um, I'm very excited um, I've had had the opportunity to talk with some of the the other friends of the library they're very enthusiastic and excited yep. about it and so I think it's a great project for the southern part of our county and for Midland and and um, I certainly hope that I can do anything possible to help you as you go through that process. Appreciate that. All of the friends of the library have volunteered to help us. Some have actually donated books that were left over from their book sales and just a lot of things um, coming out of the woodworks to help us, and that's what we're really excited about. And my only comment would be that um, commissioners, by um, letting them know that we want them to go forward with the concept as we begin our budget talks in January, and we're identifying um, the priorities of this board, then um, we are committing that we will be addressing that issue as they get numbers and that it will be part of our budget process. That's what they're, that's what us saying Asking. to go forward with actually means. So right. there will be a budget impact. We just have to get the numbers on it. Okay. Right. But we're saying that we are willing to go forward with it. Right. So. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, you don't if, need a hard motion though. Correct. They, they might, uh, uh, we would like a formal motion if we could. Okay. That way we're we're covering all of our bases, and if anybody says anything, we can say we got it. Okay. So <laughs> um, the requested action that we have, uh, it's page 172 in your agenda, is to approve Midland Library concept and begin negotiations with the town of Midland for the operating costs. Do I have such a motion? Uh, I move that um, that we send this message to Midland that we approve in concept the, the library uh, project and, and intend to work with them to refine the numbers as we go forward. Okay, there is a motion and there's a second and I will draw your attention, I'm sorry I forgot, that we do have a handout mm -hmm. at your seats that show um, some of the county expenses. They're not exact at this point in time. Um, but we would be looking at the level. county expenses plus the plus um, staffing. Plus staffing. Yeah. Okay, so that give you an, a beginning idea of what kind of costs we're looking for. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. all of your support. Sorry Thank I couldn't you. be at your work session. But Thank you. We're glad to see you tonight. Thank you. That's what matters. Um, next we have, uh, that concludes our new business. Now we have appointments to boards and committees. Um, for the Council for a Sustainable Local Economy, um, we need a motion to remove Tracy Dry from the council and thank her for her service. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, next, the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee. Um, due to some travel issues, uh, Leroy Diebler has resigned. So this time I accept a motion to remove Leroy Diebler from the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee roster and to thank him for his service. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Just to make a comment, that particular committee has seven vacant positions and we would highly encourage um, citizens who want to be involved to um, please fill out an application to um, join that committee. 
Um, next, we have um, the Cabarrus County Youth Council. Um, we have quite a few of these. We have a number of students that have graduated. So, Commissioners, I would need a motion to remove Casey Aldridge from Concord High School, Seth Bolenbecker from Mount Pleasant High School, Cheyenne Carruthers from Northwest Cabarrus High School, Ryan Essick from Hickory Ridge High School, and Ryan Hines from Central Cabarrus High School from the Cabarrus County Youth Council roster and thank them for their service. Do I have a motion? Move. Have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Um, next, we need a motion to remove Daniel Hicks and Harrison Reef from the roster. Their terms have ex expired June 30, 2013. Do I have such a motion? Do so I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Next, we have a motion to appoint Kelly Curry from Central Cabarrus High School and Sophia Politis from Hickory Ridge High School to the council for two year terms ending June the 30th. 2015. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Uh, Any opposed? And a motion to appoint Brianna Meisenhammer from Hickory Ridge High School to the council for a one year term ending June 30th, 2014. So moved. Have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Uh, Any opposed? Okay. Um, next, we're down to general comments by board members. Are there any general comments that anyone would like to make? Uh, Madam Chairman, I would just make a, <clears throat> a couple comments and I will abbreviate uh, them due to the late hour. Um, was, was my pleasure along with several other commissioners to um, attend the Cabarrus Vocational um, uh, Workshop Open House on Sunday? Um, that was a, a great experience to see the work that they do there. Uh, and I would encourage any of you to, to go out and, and talk with those clients and those staff members and see what they do. Um, the, our Midland folks have left us. I was going to mention that I did attend their count, town council meeting last week and much to my surprise had to drive all the way to Midland in the snow. Um, that, that was something we don't normally expect this time of, time of the year. Um, uh, due to, to the reports that, that have been in the newspaper and other discussion of the action of this board, it's been mentioned several times that I did uh, make a trip to China last month. Uh, that is something that I could, could talk about for, for quite a few hours, but, uh, you know, of course, people say, what were you doing in China? Uh, so I wanted to mention that very briefly. Um, I was there with a group from the Center for International Understanding which is part of the University of North Carolina system uh, that puts together sponsorships for these trips. The focus of this trip was North Carolina jobs in the pharmaceutical area and medical device industries. So we met with um, quite a few biotech companies in China, uh, also went to some of their facilities. We also visited with some North Carolina companies that are doing business in China. Uh, and then talk with a number of, of folks and organizations to tell them about the opportunities that exist here in North Carolina for biotech and pharmaceuticals. Um, as part of that, that trip, and this kind of kind of bleeds into the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, we had an opportunity to visit, I think probably one of the, one of the more enjoyable parts of the trip for me was visiting with one of their high schools. Uh, there in China and getting an opportunity to talk with some of the students and and make some 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 comparisons as to to how things are here uh, it was quite quite obvious to me when we arrived at the high school that they had definitely picked their very top students to 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 take us around as tour guides uh, the young man that I had was um, you know for some reason I always think of, of folks in uh, China as being shorter but he was about uh, almost a foot taller than me, uh, but very serious about what he was doing. We talked about their, um, their schedule. They come to school at, at six, uh, 7.30 in the morning uh, and stay until 6 p.m. Um, I think their, their clubs and their extracurriculars are included in that. Uh, they get an hour and a half for lunch. 
They're required to exercise as a group every morning, and we were able to, to uh, observe that, that exercise period. Um, the, the high school looked very much like the schools that we have here. Um, the, I think that this high school was probably what we would label as a STEM school, uh, heavy emphasis on science, technology, mathematics. Uh, they, um, the, the one thing that was, was interesting in talking to these students uh, is the, most of the ones that I had an opportunity to talk with, their number one goal is to do well on their college entrance exam because that will determine the course of the rest of their life. Uh, they want to do well enough to come to the United States to attend one of our colleges and universities here. So obviously we're, we're doing some things right. Um, I had an opportunity, and I, I, on the China thing, you know, we went to some uh, high-tech parks that they have created there to encourage biotech industries, uh, and we went actually to two of those in two different areas of the country. Um, you know, one of the questions I asked one of them, they said they wanted to encourage Chinese companies to get into this business. Uh, my question was, well, what, what exactly, I mean, how do you do, what, how do you encourage them? What kind of things do you do? Uh, do they get a discount on the rent of these, of this lab space or these facilities? Uh, the answer I got was, well, if they're willing to, to, to start up the company in this area, we'll give them the rent free for three years. Uh, so that just gives you some indication as to how aggressive they are and uh, what they're trying to do. Uh, back, back to the school piece of it, you know, I also had an opportunity over the last month to visit the early college high school program with Rowan Cabrera's Community College in cooperation with, I think there are some Kannapolis City Schools and Cabarrus County Schools working together on that. Uh, those students were very impressive, the panel that they had to talk to us. Uh, and and it, it was was really a great experience to hear how our school systems are being innovative and in what they're doing to provide for the different levels and interests of students. This morning, I had an opportunity to spend a couple hours out at J.N. Fries Middle School, uh, which is one of the magnet schools here in Cabarrus County. Uh, part of the school is a STEM school, and the other part is an international baccalaureate program. Um, th I can honestly say that the students that, that I talked to at J.N. Freeze and at the Early College High School are every bit as serious and dedicated as those students in China. Uh, you know, we sometimes we hear people talk about they have uh, an edge on us, uh, but uh, it was very encouraging to make that comparison. Um, and see how, how serious our students are. But it was an excellent trip. I think that uh, we had 11 state legislators on the trip, some senators and House members. Uh, we had folks from the North Carolina Department of Commerce. Uh, we had people from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture uh, looking at different aspects. Uh, it was very surprising to me to learn of the great appetite that the Chinese people have for American products. Um, you know, when you walk down the main street of the, of the larger cities, and their, their larger cities are large, I, I think uh, about four times the population of the state of North Carolina in one city. But the names that you see on the stores are the same names that we would see in our local malls. Uh, and so there are many, many opportunities for North Carolina companies to export goods to China. And I think there are quite a few opportunities for us to recruit some of those companies here, provide jobs in our area. Uh, so it was very, very worthwhile trip and I would encourage anybody to take advantage of that. Um, the next question people ask is um, who paid for it? Um, it is, there are no governmental funds involved in these trips at all. They are all through sponsorships. Um, my trip was sponsored by the Hayes Foundation here in Cabarrus County, and they sponsor two trips um, uh, each year. Uh, one 
that uh, person representing the Cabarrus County School System and another representing the Kannapolis City School System and uh, the Kannapolis City School System was uh, asked me to go as their representative. So it was, uh, was a wonderful trip and, um, and I would encourage anybody to do it. Thank you. All right, good. I, I just wanted to repeat, um, um, I had mentioned this at a work session, but people had been um, had some confusion about it. If you lost channel 22 on your television because uh, you don't have a cable box, go to channel 97.2. You will find it. It will be there, and you can watch us if you'd like to, and we appreciate everybody that does watch us. The newspaper comes, and they, they, they try to report on what we're doing, but they really have limited space, and um, we'll talk about some pretty complex issues in here for long periods of time, and they can't really do adequate job of explaining those complexities, and so coming or watching on TV is greatly appreciated, and um, channel 97.2, and if you have an older TV and you don't get channel 97.2, the cable company will give you for uh, a year for free an adapter, which is not a set-top box. It's just a little adapter, and after the first year, it's $1 per month. So um, uh, we ha I have had several emails about um, receiving Channel 22 and that being discontinued, and I, I like for everybody to be involved in their government. But you can't get it on satellite, correct? That's right. Okay. But you can get it on the Internet. Um, I have one announcement I was asked to make. Um, if you walk into a Cabarrus County government building, you will notice the Wendy Ganey Memorial Christmas Tree Program is underway. Gift trees are part of a special annual program of the Cabarrus County Helping Hearts and Hands Organization, an employee-run charitable committee in memory of Wendy Ganey, a longtime employee of the county who was passionate about giving back to our community. Now through December the 10th, Cabarrus residents can join county employees in selecting a tag and making a holiday wish a reality for local children, individuals in group homes, senior citizens, veterans, and more. Just before Christmas, CH3 volunteers will deliver the gifts to individuals and families served by Cabarrus County's agencies and community partners. Those who wish to provide gifts may select a gift tag from a Christmas tree at one of seven locations, including the Government Center, Senior Centers in Concord and Mount Pleasant, and any of the four branches of the Cabarrus Library. Unwrapped presents in gift bags are due back to the tree location where you selected the gift tag by Tuesday, December the 10th. For additional information on the program, you can stop by any of the tree locations or visit Cabarrus County website, which is www.cabarruscounty.us. So we encourage you to participate. Um, appreciate everybody that's here tonight. Thank you all. Y'all stay for the long haul. And uh, commissioners, we do have a need to go into closed session tonight. Um, <coughs> pursuant to discuss personnel matters as authorized by North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11-A6. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So say don't, don't everybody jump on it at the same time. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next month.